Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final session of our policy forum on untapping the potential of non-wood forest products for Europe's green economy. My name is Stephen Liebrecht, and as for the other sessions, I will be your facilitator, guiding all of us through the coming few hours. Let me briefly do share screening again to proceed with introducing uh, this particular session. Okay. Yes. So we had a two-day event, basically, with the first day, yesterday, focusing on, first of all, setting the scene, disclosing the potential of non-wood forest products. And then in the afternoon, during the, the second session, we have been focusing on sustainable sourcing and secure supply of non-wood forest products. Then, today, this morning, the focus was on competitive and equitable non-wood forest products value chains. But now we are approaching or we are starting session number four, the final session. And this is basically where we're trying to bring all the pieces of this puzzle that we have been investigating together in a session that we call a call for action. For this session, we have a new rapporteur. His name is Sven Mutke from INEA, and he will be assisted uh, just like for the pre previous sessions by Ricardo Castellini from CZ4 Foundation. Now, let us focus on what is on the menu for this particular session called Call for Action. Well, first of all, we would like to spend a little bit of time on this document, which is the white paper on non-wood forest products for people, nature, and the green economy. Policy priorities for Europe, a white paper based on lessons learned from across the Mediterranean. That is a very long title, we realize, but it's basically the document that has served as a kind of a reference for the entire policy forum. So almost all sessions have consistent of basically components that you will find back in that uh, white paper. And for this reason, I think it's a very good idea and suggestion to just spend a little bit of time exploring what this document is about. So that will be the first part. Then we will prepare, proceed by going to a panel discussion and debate on which we will be focusing on views from national, European and international institutions. So that is the second item on our menu. Then obviously, we still have to consider the manifesto. So the document that has been presented and for which you all had the opportunity to send in your suggestions. So we will take a look at that. But before we do that, we would like to bridge basically from the panel discussion to this manifesto. And the best way to do so, we thought, was to spend a little bit of time on bridging on future initiatives. So we take it a little bit beyond Europe and consider uh, additional perspectives. And after considering then the manifesto, huh, I think it, sh it should be about time to take a couple of conclusions from this uh, um, policy forum and to bring it to, well, and to explain the next steps. And that will be it for today. Now, some points on how we will run the session. Some of you might have seen this site already a couple of times. And each time there is some minor modification. So yes, again, we will have presentations. There might be some video material. There is going to be a polling exercise. There is room for Q&A. We are using Zoom webinar. So that means that regular attendees do not have the same facilities as presenters, right? with respect to the use of camera microphone. This is just to make things feasible, knowing that we have uh, lots of participants uh, being part of this uh, policy forum, and we are very grateful for that, obviously. So the organizers are the parties that can fiddle around with the settings, and if needed, somebody can be upgraded and might indeed use uh, a regular participant, might get uh, the use for the microphone, but it's not standard. We have a Q&A button below the screen, uh, which enables you, the participants, to post your questions. Some of these can even be handled immediately in the same section, questions and answers. Uh, but we have a team of people 
that are continuously monitoring the questions and answers, and that will be selecting some of uh, selecting questions and answers or questions that will be dealt with uh, in life, basically during this policy forum. We also have a chat functionality as in regular Zoom, but we would like to ask you to reserve the chat for more technical uh, comments, I would say. Don't hesitate to send in your questions even during the presentations. Don't wait for the last minute. Uh, the more time we get in looking at what's happening uh, in the Q&A, the more time we can, uh, uh, the more time we have to get organized. And then a final word, and this is new and specific for this uh, particular session, there is an additional button that you will see. It is called interpretation, right? If you would need an interpretation or translation between Italian and, in and English, this is the place where to look for, right? So you push the interpretation button and you select the language you, language you would like to hear. If there is no need for you to have interpretation, uh, some persons will be talking in Italian. If you are... Uh, if you master that language, uh, obviously you were free to, uh, to listen uh, to it directly. Now, again, a last point on the respect for the debate, the respect for the timings. We try to keep the event on track, which means that sometimes we have to shorten some questions uh, or to have to, uh, we have to cut uh, short some of the sessions. But that the only reason for that is that we know uh, that there is a program that we try to complete and we hope you understand. Uh, one final reminder then, this session is being recorded. You should have uh, received a notification of that uh, when joining the session. If you haven't seen that notification, then at least uh, this is a reminder of that. I think we're all set to go. So I will stop my screen sharing and introduce you the person that is going to explain and elaborate a little bit on this white paper. So this document with the extremely long title, uh, the person that I would like to introduce is a person that you have already seen earlier this morning, also yesterday. Uh, he has already introduced, uh, I think he was one of the first presenters in this policy forum. His name is Inacio Martinez. He's the head of AFIMED, the European Forest Institute Mediterranean Facility. Inacio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I will share my screen. Hopefully, it's going to work well. There it goes. Can you see it now? <clears throat> yes, it's perfect. Okay, thank you. So here is uh, this 20-minute presentation about this, this white paper, this call for action that we've been uh, discussing through these two days. So, um, Reflecting on this uh, morning and today's morning session, and, and how many of the issues have already been raised, and I thought it was maybe too much to go very much in detail into what we proposed there uh, for the white paper. So I thought uh, that it would maybe more useful for you to understand how we made it, and, and what are the main lines and the main ideas and, and ideas behind. Uh, so, <clears throat> so what to expect from this call? Uh, this call is this this, this talk. It's a call for feedback from your side and to hear what you think of this document and its content. You have all received it and we have already discussed many of the, of the, of the items inside there. So we expect that you can be active and, and signal us if you like it, what are, if, if it has some strengths, if it has some such shortcomings. So we will deconstruct the, <clears throat> I will explain you the process of how we made it and it will deconstruct a little bit its contents and core ideas and hopefully there is time for you to, to give us this feedback. So first of all, this white paper is, is, is emerging from, a, from the Mediterranean region, from, an, from a network of, of actors in the Mediterranean coming from different domains. We have science research centers like University of Yanonina or the First Research Institute of Croatia or the Catalan CTFC. We have, uh, we have uh, actors that are more in the, in the knowledge transfer in, in forestry like the CMPF or spin-offs also mobilizing knowledge for action in the business side, like like it for. Uh, we have governments of Sardinia represented by the Forest Agency Forestas and Castilla Leon represented by the TS4 Foundation. And we have VFI, which we have Engref as a research center in Tunisia, and we have VFI as an organization that we network organization we place ourselves in the interface between science and policy making. So it's a diverse, it's a diverse network, and, and we have been working the last three years 
in five uh, networks of innovation on cork, nuts and berries, resin, mosses and truffle, aromatic and medicinal plants. <clears throat> I think I lost my presentation. Okay, so so of course, of course, we build in, in previous processes. We build very much in the Star Trek project. You have it there. We have the link also in the chat that we, as you mentioned quite several times, we build on the cost action on our forest products that uh, was, was working before for several years also. And we have connect with other networks, of course, the UFRO task force and bioeconomy and animal forest products and FAO uh, large efforts in, in also non forest products at the global scale. So, um, so the starting point of this of this uh, innovation networks was a collective mapping of the different value chains, looking at who produces the supply, who is the picker, who is the harvester, who is the manager of the land, how this is sell, formal informal markets, grey markets, how how this is transferred through middlemen or not to processors, and, and what is happening inside this first second transformation and how it how it reaches the market. So through this mapping, we identify barriers, blocks, opportunities, challenges, gathering the views of, of different actors in the value chain, associations of pickers, individual pickers, harvester workers, trade unions, companies, retailers, etc. And we did this separately for the different value chains. Okay, but then we had several activities. Uh, starting from this point, we made an iterative process of going addressing those challenges we had identified, looking at different, uh, different um, interregional workshops and science to practice events, engaging stakeholders and different actors, trying to find solutions, best examples, cases, available knowledge to, to try to fix some of the, of the key, key core issues that we, we had identified, of course, with the feedback loops. And then we had some activities across these different INETs that we call them, innovation networks, in a community of practice. So we could share experiences, lessons learned, transfer information. So we had this iterative process of innovation and, and knowledge sharing within each of the networks. And then we have this community of practice across them also with cross-cutting activities like seminars focusing on specific issues that are of general interest, open innovation challenges that we conducted to ask the broader community to, to help us finding solutions. And, and, and we, we are a common repository of knowledge where some of the cases or examples are relevant for everybody else. So, and of course, through this process, we've been condensing policy lessons and recommendations uh, that emerge, uh, and, and this is what we have compiled. So just to give you a flavor of the project uh, intensities, we, we had uh, activities specifically on territorial marketing, territorial approaches, linkages between non good forest products and the territory, in tourism, also in payment for custom services opportunities, specific seminars and activity across all these INETs in business and entrepreneurship, what are the opportunities, challenges, uh, needs for action and of course uh, and also in digitalization new techno new communication and digital technologies how they can be applied to, to some of these issues so there was the process we start with the with the value chain mapping mapping of the actors mapping of the challenges opportunities as seen by the different actors this this challenge have been even have been worked out in, in an iterative process and, and and we have produced of course with the feedbacks across the INETs and 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 then we have produced, as, as some of the core output, this knowledge repository with uh, ready-to-use knowledge in the language of the European Commission and, and best cases, practices, and, and of course, again, uh, these this policy conclusions for use. So let me tell you uh, just one reflection on this process. Uh, when we look at the problems that the different stakeholders are facing, uh, if we look, uh, many of them, or most of them, are, are in the supply side. And this is interesting discussing also with industrial partners, some of them very powerful industries, uh, very, very strong uh, global leaders in resin or in cork or, or mid-sized pine processors or, or mushroom dealers. Um, uh, it's something which is maybe self-evident, but it's worth re deep reflection. It's most, mo most of the issues are not, not related to, to technology or process or product development. They are, they are most of them are, 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 have to do with the supply side, how to arrange, how to how to to source the biomass, how to source the products, the ingredients. Uh, and then we have many other issues at the end of the value chain in the access to market. I come, I come back to this. But in, in the middle, what we have is a, a general, let's say, a more general request or necessity to have a, an industrial ecosystem that works, linkage with science, 
political support or, or, or subsidies or support lines for industry, but in a very general, um, not very different from any other any other sector. So what we really have specifically here is, is the supply side, because we are working with nature and with multiple actors, and, and then in the market side. And not, not, not done so many things in the middle. So the, the, the supply side challenges are related to the uncertainties that climate change brings. We have discussed a lot of sustainable harvesting with all these dimensions in terms of knowledge, practices, control monitoring. Uh, sometimes the lack of resource, cork industry, could, they, they are confident that they could, they could, uh, they could really make a much larger impact. They have fantastic portfolio of products in, in fashion, in construction, flooring, um, of course, in a stoppers of, 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 of very different qualities, but they are they are really constrained by the lack of resource. And, it's, and the contradiction is here that many many core producing stands are being abandoned in in France, in Italy, in many other places, in Catalonia. So this is a key issue: that, uh, the, the availability of resource. Then this lack of profitability at the bottom of the of the value chain. Here, this graphic is representing the added value in the in the sustainable cosmetic business. Uh, for the first steps in the value chain, there is very little. Uh, all the values captured downstream, and this means that these value chains are, are very difficult. They have a lot of difficulties to generate enough profit, and this means to pay improved salaries and to mobilize uh, also the workforce uh, in, 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 in where you have sometimes difficult working conditions or not very well, uh, let's say, socially accepted or socially validated uh, conditions. Lack of skilled labor, sometimes access rights. And fit regulation, for example, for the Cork DSAs, where uh, the current regulation we hear commission uh, representative, representative from European Commission yesterday, acknowledging that the that the agroforestry system are not well recognized, not well supported, and even there is a perverse incentive to take the trees out to to increase the, the direct payments in the cap, and of course everything that is related to these micro enterprises or whatever. But there are, you see, there are many many issues, and, and a reflection here is that. Most of the science that we have and the knowledge is not targeting these issues. Most of them are social issues. It's about social innovation. It's about arrangement. It's about trust. It's about business modeling or, or, or business models, but uh, and this ecological uh, social setup. Okay, then and then there is key challenge in the access to market. And, and let's say this is the confusion in the market. We, we don't know. We can have eco ecological pine nuts, but are there from where? Uh, we have trufa flavors everywhere. What type of trufa is that one? It's artificial, natural, difficult to know. And if we go to elaborated products, it's even more difficult. So this confusion in the market, uh, the, the impossibility to, to make the best on the positive externalities of a wild or a natural product uh, that is lost uh, in, in most of the cases. And this means increased concurrence with bio and non-bio non cultivated or concurrence with imported products uh, as a substitutes. Uh, and with this, we, we understand this is bad for the local producers because they have companies for the imported, but also it's bad for the countries of origin because uh, also the, the, most of the utilities or most of the benefits is extracted by the trader and not by the producer there. So we have all these, all these issues to the market and this is, these are, the, let's say, very summarizing common elements cross-cutting. This will, this will be this and you will see in the white paper that we are not putting a lot of emphasis let's say, in innovation, in products, in transformation, uh, that we are focusing a lot in the supply and in the market side. And this is why this flow of information, this leveling, um, these traceability issues are so prominent. And, and it was very interesting to see in the morning, in the, in the pooling we made in the boat, that this is specifically data, data flows is, is the most important one for, for the, for the uh, attendance to, the, to this webinar, because it, it relates very, very strong as the connection between the supply side and the market side. And this connection, of course, is also bro broken in the first second transformation uh, process, but it's mainly because we don't have the market pool and we don't have the origin traceability set up. So then in the middle, it's much more difficult to work it out. So this will be very generally the challenges that we identify, the challenges that we are addressing in the white paper, why it has the content that, that it has. And, and we believe that uh, despite this the strong met Mediterranean flavor, as we write, is relevant also beyond the Mediterranean and beyond this specifically five, let's say, subsectors or five subtypes of, of non wood forest products. But of course, it's not only barriers, it's not only difficulties. We, we also worked a lot on opportunities and, and there are many strong mega trends emerging. These lifestyles of health and sustainability also in some cases the halal tourism, uh, many, many, many elements there, they're related to, to these healthy li lifestyles that, that, that uh, these wild nature-based um, forest-based products can, um, 
can address is the bioeconomy, the, the carbonization, replacement of fossil fuels, etc. This is a strong, a strong policy and market trend that is emerging. And of course, specifically, this experiential tourism, this natural rural tourism uh, strong push that I think after the COVID-19, I don't know if, if I, I'm sure it's I don't have the data for, for all of Europe or the world, but it's in many regions it's actually happening that the rural tourism is really having a, a boom in, in, in demand. And of course, many intrinsic values, many intrinsic properties of the product, some of them linked to their specific flavors or, or qualities, but sometimes also linked to the, to the values associated in terms of naturalness, wilderness, natural conservation, etc. So, so there is many, many opportunities to build up on and we also try to, to capture them. So as, as saying you, I, we, we see a lot of graphs and things, but this, this project is about people. We had over, over 70 events discussing all these ideas, looking for examples, discussing with the stakeholders, what they feel. And we have tried to systematically also gathering also in this community of practice, gather all these recommendation solutions we draft with all these uh, heavy technical document and, and then we summarize it and condense in the white paper. So coming to the white paper, uh, it's like uh, one of uh, our flagships in terms of making an impact outside, um, in the outside world also. So what is the objective of, of the white paper? It's, it's, it's a call to recognize the values and to leverage them, you know, was for products. I think we are answering James' uh, proposal that we need governments to take responsibility. And here we call governments, but not, not, also, not only governments. Uh, to recognize this as a natural resource, as a, as a heri cultural heritage that has big potentials to contribute to the SDGs, to, to policy priorities, and, and, and to do something with this recognition, to, the, to really take action. Uh, so we identify for this the key policy areas that we think must be adapted, tackled, that require attention, and then for these areas we suggest action, as said, not only by the decision makers, which is important, of course, but also by other stakeholders, and some, some actions are at the global level, some actions are at regional, national, or local levels. So this is a little bit in a nutshell what we pretend with the white book. So, so this is the content. We have an initial chapter where we say, hey, this is what we are doing for the SDGs. This is what non first policies can do for EU, in this case, EU core policies like the Green Deal, the forest strategy, um, the pharma, the far, food and uh, farm to fork strategy, the pharma strategy, the green chemistry strategy or policy. Mm -hmm. So so here we have, been, uh, we have been victims of this lack of data. Uh, and sometimes, many times politicians ask you facts and figures, employment, uh, trade, volume, uh, and, and, and there is little, there is, there is not easy to find and there are many reports of different quality. So, but then we have tried, we made our best to make the point for non forest products. And then we summarize what are the major gaps that explain why this large potential is not being totally developed or realized. So very, very, in a summary, we have these four elements. The first one is that we have too many known unknowns that thwart the strategic decision making. Uh, there are many gaps in our knowledge and understanding, so it's difficult to really plan, address in a systematic way um, what to do and how to move forward these potentials. Second is this very, very fragmented policy landscape uh, and the lack of coherent action. We're very happy to hear also DG Agri head of unit yesterday, that he discussed this limbo where the non forest products are, and it is one of the core ideas, I think, of this white paper, non forest products are, are in a, sometimes in a no man land or no woman land. Um, they are in the boundary between agriculture and forestry, between wild and managed. Um, and this makes that uh, many of the policies, like for example, the food regulation not, not fully applies, traceability requirements for food sometimes amazingly are not applied to Muslim. We hear some problems with intoxication of Muslim. This is a problem also of traceability uh, and, and, and correct labeling. Um, so, so, so we think we need to also for policy support in the CAP in many, in many other cases. So we really think we need, we need to bring these products out of the, out of this limbo or out of these boundary areas and clarify where they are. <clears throat> then, of course, we discuss the supply gap, let's say. Uh, in some cases, the supply gap, the, 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 we have some questions in the morning also uh, signaling at the risk of our exploitation, if we can 
uh, supply everything. So we're looking at this. Do we have enough resin? Do we have enough cork? Do we have enough mushroom? Do we have enough tannins to supply a bioeconomy or, or the growing demand? And, and what can we do to fulfill this gap? Uh, uh, so we consider different options, but of course also um, domestication and, and other issues. And then, um, and then of course we need the, the need to do secure sustainable har harvesting and, and fair trade, both inside Europe and also in the countries of origin of imported products. Europe is is a major importer of, of importer of non-wood forest products, and Europe has a responsibility, both the governments at the EU level, individual governments, but also operators, to secure. Um, the sustainability, the harvest level, the harvest te techniques, but also the, the fairness and equitability of, of, of trade. And not only of trade, uh, internal production and, and trade. So this will be in a nutshell, uh, what are the major gaps that we are um, addressing here? Uh, and for this, and I'm going to be go very brief on these slides, don't, don't, don't get afraid, this is a summary of the actions we recommend. So we extract a lot of the policy recommendations, in these four, four areas. First one is securing the conservation and sustainable supply. So here we discuss about enhancing the resource base, how to activate, we need to activate management in many cases, we need sometimes to look at domestication, we need to, to recognize agroforestry systems, we need to, of course to develop instruments for long-term long investment and, 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 and bridge this gap on, on return to investment, um, and we need to, to look for a forestry which is more integrative and, and we move from their first approaches to more multifunctional, uh, service first and multifunctional, multifunctionality first approaches in forestry. Second, we, we look at how to ensure the harvest levels. So we need to build capacities. We need advisory services that are um, that have the content and the capacities to assessorate and to promote innovation in these sectors. We need trained workers. We need monitoring and control, but also we need harvest, clear harvest rights that are respected and, and, and regulated probably. And then we, move, we we recommend we have issues related to to improve monitoring system. We have discussed extensively in, in the in the past day and a half on on how we need and how we can do this at different levels. Uh, Jane was telling us at the at the corrigion level, at the national level, at the local level, etc. How this can be embedded in the national inventories. We had the case of Serbia that they are advancing clearly in this area. So so many of these things are illustrated with examples and activities. Then we have a second big. Uh, area that we have been discussing, building competitive and equitable value chains. So we need territorial place-based value chains. Sometimes we need, we, we need to open public forests to, to co-management. We, we think we need to contra contractualize relationships with pickers and, and, and processors. In some cases, this is like the riders of, of Globo or Delivero or Uber Foods. Uh, these riders are workers for a company, but they're in a, in a legal limbo as autonomous. I think we need to contractualize to clarify these relationships. Of course, the issues related to business models, to the synergies with tourism, which are so, so strategic, as David was telling us. Um, we need to differentiate in the markets and support this differentiation, the quality, origin, and sustainability. Also, David was building on that and, and, and has input, of course, to this white paper in this respect. Uh, promote certification, we had also from traffic and Anastasia uh, some highlights in this respect and maybe support ecosystem payment for ecosystem services because we need to, to make these externalities, uh, to internalize them and, 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 and to make all this, uh, to bridge this, this, this great market failure also at the bottom of the value chain. So we are also demanding new fiscal and labor regime. We have a long section in that. We are discussing the Italian developments and how we can, we, we can clarify this fiscal regime, not, not only because tax is important as a revenue, is because it's the entry point for traceability. We need to know who is the picker, so we know we need the, the right taxation system, so the picker will become legal and will not become uh, grey or black in the market. So, so taxation is it goes beyond collecting taxes. Is because we need to establish trust and fairness at the base of the value chain and be able to identify from there in the process. Labor policies for seasonality. And then, of course, we need to strengthen pickers associations, producer associations, increase transparency, price setting, trust in the value chain, uh, etc. Maybe probably uh, help integrate downstream in some cases, so the profit that is made downstream reverts into upstream. We have a lot, a, a lot on, on traceability and innovation flow. We have discussed a lot on this. How we need this list of, of priority species. How we need additional surveys, additional data, collective effort. We highlight the responsibility of operators 
in, in, in providing data in their sectors. And, and, and we make a call to them, to companies and, and operators to, to open their records in, in volumes, in trade, in imports, but hopefully also in prices to give a, a, a more fair environment and fair markets. So we, we discussed uh, traceability, labeling with some examples there. I think we have insisted in this. We highlight some ICT solutions, some new technology that can be applied for this. And, and that's it, this facility access to that I was mentioning already. And finally, we, we discussed this enabling conditions and maybe here we are asking governments at different levels to create coherent, coherent non-wood forest product plans for the core, more relevant ones. So we can have a, a more coherent political action. Um, of, and, and some of the actions are of higher level. Huh? We need, a, we need a, to advance between common, more shared views about conservation versus, versus management and how we can make the best of our natural resources for, for human well-being, for, for biodiversity and, 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 and for the economy. Um, and we discuss a lot about this hierarchy of uses, cascade, circular approaches, efficiency of use, because we know we have scarce natural resources in, in very general terms. Anyway, we, it's, a, it's a claim to develop a coherent framework, starting maybe from, from this uh, national or regional plans and also clarifying where non-forest products are in this limbo or in this boundary between policies. Uh, we, we discuss again the need for increased financial support for some specific issues and to solve some specific barriers and, and, and general call also to foster innovation. I was telling you before, when it comes to science, I think there is a brilliant and bright community on research, but it's, it's a lot focused on, on, on biophysical issues. And I think we need to increase the social and ecological dimensions of non forest products, the social science side of research, but also we need to be much more able to transfer this knowledge. I think there is a critical role of, of the advisory services and rural innovation agencies. I think we, we need a lot more of, of innovation and a bit less maybe of control. If we look at the our forest, forest services, they, they, came, they came along uh, or they were created when forestry or forest cover was at the minimum, at the historical minimum. And, and they have a strong steel mentality of protecting the resource, which is necessary. But maybe on top of this, we need to, we need more, uh, more capacities and more uh, human resources and more focus on, on generating innovation with with uh, forest products in in general terms. Um, so so this, this will be the core messages: more social science and more more uh, more transfer of this knowledge and more specifically support to rural innovation and to embed the non forest products in rural development uh, agency agendas. So this is in a, is, is in a nutshell the white paper. I don't know if I, I went too fast or it was a bit too much uh, this overview. I hope it was, was useful for you to, to make a fresh reading to it and to understand a little bit where this comes from. Thank you, Stephen. Excellent. Thank you so much, Inacio, for again, a very rich presentation. Uh, I can imagine that uh, some people perhaps haven't received uh, or seen this document. Um, could you perhaps make a statement on uh, whether these people could receive the document or when will it be ready if we feel it is not yet, in, not yet ready? Because it's a white paper and I, I think many people will be interested in this. Could you give a comment on that? Yes, we, we send this white paper to all participants. Uh, before this, so all registered participants should have received it, unless maybe they, they, they registered very, very in the last minute. Um, they can let, um, ask in the chat or, or, or send us an email. We can send a copy. And our idea is after this policy forum uh, to, to, to make a final review of the content. We still have not developed the summary, the conclusions, but maybe there are some specific measures that we can, we will still uh, improve. So, so, so there is some time. Excellent. Yes. So in the chat, uh, people, my participants might find the, the web link to the document, I understand. Uh, Sarah, perhaps you would like to make a comment? That was all I was going to say, but I'll oh, just okay. put the link in the chat. <laughs> Excellent. So yes, uh, you should, most attendees should have already received the white paper, but there might be still uh, slight changes coming up. And anyhow, you can have, if you haven't received it, uh, the web link is the place where to find it. Okay. I'm looking at whether we have questions coming in. Please, uh, people, send your questions if you have. Uh, as there are no ones at this moment, I suggest, uh, Gerard, could we 
could we have one of these videos? One of these, we have this collection of short videos. Steven, Steven maybe Gerhard has placed a question. Maybe he, he wants to do it live. My, my apologies. Yes, for me, that is okay. I'm just juggling too many screens. My apologies. So Gerhard is there. He was very active in a starter project and, and dealing with innovation. So I'm, okay. I think he can, he can have well, a very good input here. I imagine, Sarah, could you give... Uh, I promoted a him. He should be able to, to join okay. now. So when you feel you have the option, uh, Gerard, please uh, make a statement. Gerard, I think you should have received the rights now to uh, activate your microphone and your camera. Okay, if not, if Gerhard maybe is not... Uh... Okay. I will leave him there and then he could join later. No problem. In the meantime, in the meantime, let's proceed with this video. So shall we look uh, at one of these shorter videos we have that show the richness of, of non-wood forest forest. And yes, the video is about to start. Insula Natural Body Care is an herbalist cosmetic laboratory born in 2018 in Sardinia. At Insula, we aim at creating high quality products that use only natural ingredients and are always completely biodegradable. All our formulas are developed according to the criteria of the Mediterranean herbal tradition, using the typical Sardinian essences. Many of our ingredients derive from organic farming or are collected from the spontaneous flora. This is the case of the Helichrysum italicum microfilum that grows endemic only in Sardinian cores. From the Helichrysum, we produce the essential oils that enrich our soaps and skincare products. This is the most remarkable outcome of our true herbalist passion. Okay, wonderful. Well, I, I believe uh, all of you will agree with me that it's it's a nice collection of short videos. We, we still have uh, many more that we would like to just drop in every now and then. And I think we intend to make these available also through the website. And for sure, these are going to be elements that we also will use for the final conference of our project. Now, before proceeding, let's give a, let's have a last check on whether uh, Gerhard, Gerhard, in the meantime, uh, has found the facility to, or, or the way to activate the microphone so that he could give a comment on the, the white paper. Stephen, I'm not seeing a microphone icon activated okay. for him, so I can't um, help with that. No one. problem. Then we just proceed with the program. And then let's take the next stop on our journey we are having all together. And as the next point, we are going to have a panel debate. And for this panel debate, or during this panel debate, we will basically be looking at non-wood forest products through different lenses. I think lenses was the word also used by Jim Chamberlain yesterday. Um, and for us, each set of these lenses obviously offers a unique perspective. And during this panel debate, we will try to explore and understand that perspective. And these perspectives are represented by participants coming, so panelists basically coming from different institutions at different levels, national level, European level, the international level. All panel members will have an opportunity to bring in a unique perspective with probably some own messages, right? Now, the perspectives we will deal with are the national level, looking at the case of a EU member state. Then we will take a look at still the national level, but at a country outside European Union. Then we will proceed with the European level, where we'll take a closer look at two associations. And finally, we'll take a look at, yes, European level. Obviously, we should also be discussing about the European Commission, right? Well, the structure of this panel 
basically will consist of two major blocks. The first block will deal about, yes, what is the place of these non-wood forest products in the political agenda, if you like, of the respective uh, panelists. So we try to understand the perspective, perhaps the challenges they face at their level. Huh? And in the second half of our panel debate, we will basically make the, the or make the, the step, take the step to, well, what needs to happen? This is, at the end of the day, this is a session on a call for action. So we need to discuss what needs to happen from their perspective, right? So that is the structure. But let's simply start the debate. And well, if we first take a closer look at this national level, it's very clear that we can say that there are several countries known for the non-wood forest products. So I think in the previous sessions, we had some great examples with some great testimonies, some excellent video material that has been presented, etc. But it's clear one of these countries, without any doubt, is going to be Italy. So we all know the great Italian food with truffles, chestnuts, pine nuts. Italy has a tradition of using and extracting value from non-wood forest products. We are therefore pleased that we can introduce in our panel, Mrs. Stefani, who is the general director of the forestry division of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in Italy. Mrs. Stefani, thank you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and welcome to this panel. Before I raise my question, I would like to highlight to all attendees, uh, she will respond, Ms. Mrs. Stefani, uh, will respond in, Ita in Italian, but you, in case you need interpretation, you can activate this button that you will uh, find at the um, below, basically at the bottom of your screen with Zoom control, right? So, Mrs. Stephanie, welcome. And could you share with us? Yes. How in could you share with us how important non-wood forest products are in the Italian context? and where non-wood forest products are positioned in the policy-making landscape in Italy. Please. Molte grazie, eh, buon pomeriggio a tutti e molti complimenti per l'organizzazione di questo forum e di tutto il lavoro che l'ha preceduto. Grazie per l'importante organizzazione di questo forum. È vero, in Italia abbiamo una grande tradizione di harvesting persone cultivation processing of NWFPS and the Italian um, landscape has been modified over the centuries by the cultivation of specific species. We have a great landscape created by man, by the humans, in order to cultivate traditional plants. This great tradition had a crisis during the 60s or 70s when people deserted, left mountains and hills, and we faced the risk for our pro typical products to disappear in favor of industrial products. Then we faced the risk to lose territories like pine forests, Example. So some crops disappeared, some species disappeared. The chestnut, uh, chestnut forest had illnesses. So we risk losing the genotype that had been selected over the centuries. There was a strong political initiative to update the regulation as a request, as a demand for what products that were considered healthier uh, with a better taste included in a food chain, which is very important for Italy, as you might know. So we had new demands and the old regulations which were which aimed at not allowing an overexploitation of the resources. 
So these regulations needed to be upgrade, uh, updated. The turning point was in 2018, when we had a series of intervention of um, new interventions at the national level to coordinate regional policies, because our organization includes a specific regional competence, but we needed a national coordination. So the new forestry law of 2018 dedicated two articles among the 19 articles of the law. So two articles of the law were specific for NWFPS. In the new law, it is written that regions had duty, the task to give value to these products, to define new management modalities, to foster the production capacity of the forest, which means to give more, to give uh, value chains which have a better performance. Because in Italy we still have some problems. We need these products need to respect traditional values, but have to be in line with modern indications and with a distinction between self-consumption self -consum and harvesting. It was published in our uh, official national documents in April, and in May we had a new regulation about medicinal plants, which is uh, the safeguard of biodiversity apparently to use this, this product. And in December of the same year, we had a new regulation about unification of fiscal systems, which will maybe I will discuss about this later. But we had the unification of the fiscal systems for all these products by making a distinction between professional harvester, professional foragers, and self-consumption. In this way, what, as we uh, heard this morning from Mr. Vidale, he talked about a collapse of businesses uh, because of tax systems which were not aligned with the needs of the businesses. So this started to grow again. And last year we had more than a hundred, more than 1,000 subscriptions only in the field of tropics. So we saw a difference between uh, a careful, careful policies made of cooperation with the stakeholder and, and a, a kind of policies that were negative for the sector. I definitely would like to continue to explore on these achievements and we will do so in the next round perhaps, but before doing so, I think it's interesting to also introduce the other uh, panel members. And after the example of Italy, let us stay for a while on this national level but consider the case of a country that is not a member of the European Union. More specifically, let's take a closer look at Ukraine. We are therefore pleased that we can welcome in our panel, Mrs. Polyakova, who is the head of International Cooperation, Science and Public Relations Division of the State Forest Resources Agency of Ukraine. Furthermore, she is also the acting chair of FAO's European Forestry Commission. Mrs. Polyakova, thank you for accepting our invitation and welcome to this panel. Could you share with us the reality on non-wood forest pro products in Ukraine? What is the current role and place of these products in Ukraine? How important are they for Ukraine? Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, organizers for inviting me. It is an honor for me to participate uh, in this important event. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, I'd like to say that uh, non-wood forest products is not very high on uh, political agenda uh, in uh, forest policy of Ukraine, uh, but it is quite important uh, for season for uh, collecting mushrooms and berries. It's quite important uh, for local population, especially in um, uh, north and uh, uh, western part of Ukraine uh, and uh, for their well-being. I'd like to underline that um, uh, we have a free access uh, to forest and people are uh, able uh, to collect whatever they want uh, for their own needs free of charge. If it is uh, industrial use uh, of uh, non-forest products, uh, non-wood forest products, uh, they must uh, obtain forest ticket, uh, which is provided by uh, local authorities, uh, uh, keeping in mind sustainability of um, uh, forest uh, resources. Uh, I'd like um, to share also my experience um, uh, and the importance uh, of uh, non-wood forest products uh, for forest enterprises. Um, in principle, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's uh, not uh, in very high uh, use, especially right now. It's um, a low awareness of importance um, uh, for, as additional source uh, for covering expenses uh, for SFM. Especially right now, where, uh, when we have um, uh, economical crisis, uh, as well as uh, consequences of climate change, resulted uh, in um, in increased uh, amount of uh, forest fires, outbreaks of pests and diseases, and of course uh, decreased quality of uh, timber aside from uh, forest. Uh, uh, so uh, use of non-wood forest products as additional source of financing is quite important. Um, if we are speaking about a uh, variety of um, uh, non-wood forest products, uh, first of all, it's game and uh, New Year's uh, trees. Uh, it's a common uh, product uh, for the whole Ukraine. However, uh, we have some regions uh, which are traditionally using uh, different uh, kind of um, different types uh, of uh, non-wood forest products, uh, especially Berlin uh, region. Uh, they, uh, they have facility uh, for uh, processing uh, birch sap, uh, they are processing different types of mushrooms, as well as producing uh, different uh, types of uh, gems uh, from, uh, from berries. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for clarifying the landscape, if you like, of non-wood forest products in Ukraine. Uh, for sure, we will uh, continue the debate later on, on, on more specific questions like challenges, etc. But let's, before we do that, let's uh, continue to bring in additional members to this panel debate. And let us now take a step from the national level to the European level. Uh, first, looking at a couple of associations. And the first perspective we would like to explore at the European level is that of state forests. And to that extent, we have as a guest, Mr. Piotr Borkowski. He is the executive director of USPAC4. Mr. Borkowski, thank you for your presence at this panel. And why don't you perhaps briefly explain what USPAC4 is? And could you then tell how you look at non-wood forest products from your, from a state forestry perspective? Thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, invitation to the event, which is indeed uh, my pleasure uh, to participate in, and then also for this nice welcome. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, for us uh, who are representing the large-scale state forest managers, the non-wood forest products is, of course, a part of the whole system, which we call as management uh, forestry system, forest management system. And then just to, uh, to, to explain may, maybe a little bit about uh, the organization as, as the association, we do represent 36 state forest organizations of different organization form coming from a, vera a number of, of, of EU member states, but also from non-EU countries. What is in common that our members are responsible for the management of the public forestry assets. 
And this is uh, particularly related to certain specific missions state forestry has in every country towards the society, because then as, as a part of the, of the offer from the government, from the state to the society is exactly, as Luba mentioned, the free access to forests. Uh, also, uh, when we discuss about uh, non-commercial use of this multitude of benefits that forests deliver, we also have to say that, especially when it comes to the to non-wood forest products, this is at the service of the society, of, 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 of the members of the society. Of course, uh, um, USTA4 and its members are Obli uh, promoting sustainable forest uh, management concept, multifunctional forestry, which is also related to the obligation of our members to directly implement the legal provisions of forest uh, legislation in each European country. Uh, and then the sustainability and multifunctional con concepts are embedded in the national legislation. But then, of course, uh, uh, referring to, to the, the non-wood forest products, in our case, is rather, as I said, uh, making it available for the society. In some cases, like also Luba described, because I think there are, there are quite a lot of similarities. And then even if Ukraine uh, is not a member, uh, the, the, the forest organization from Ukraine is not a member of, of USTA4, but then the tradition of managing uh, state forests in Central or Central and East Europe is, is rather similar. That's why also, uh, of course, in addition to benefiting from timber, sale, which is the main source of income, we in state forests very often do sell the other uh, forest products like uh, uh, stone, like gravel, like peat. Uh, so, so this comes in addition to the main source of income, but thanks to this, the, the entire system of this multifunctional and sustainable management is workable and it's ec economically on the solid basis to allow us also to serve not only non-wood forest products, but also the multitude of forest ecosystems to, to, to the society. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Borkowski. And well, obviously there are also for this uh, many more aspects to consider and we will do so in the follow-up rounds, but let's continue to bring, on, to bring in additional members to our panel. And the next uh, perspective you would like to introduce basically is that of European, but private forest studies, so not public forestry. And after the case of this public forest, let's consider private forest owners, and they are responsible of managing more than 60% of the European forests and other wooded lands. So it's a significant portion. And we are therefore pleased to welcome in this panel, Mr. Shoares, who has delivered yesterday, I think, one of this wonderful Petra Kucha speeches, but he is a Portuguese farmer and forest owner himself. He is the president of the Portuguese Landowners Association, a member of the board of CAP, Confederation of Portuguese Farmers, and a member of the board of Confederation of European Forest Owners, CEPF. I have to look up my paper to uh, be able to state all that. I hope you understand. So, Mr. Soares, Thank you for accepting our invitation. Huh? Welcome to this panel. Could you share with us the perspective of CEPF on non-wood forest products, please? Well, good afternoon, Stephen, and thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this special uh, debate uh, with such, such important uh, entities being here talking about non-wood forest products. It, it's a pleasure for me and for CPF. And, and just to make a, a, a small presentation, uh, the Confederation of European Forest Owners, CPF, represents national forest owners organizations in Europe uh, at an EU level, and it promotes the values uh, of sustainable forest management, private property ownership, and forest sector economic via viability. So being non-wood forest products, uh, an important part of the social and economical reality of European forests, CPF is well aware about the value of these products and that they have differences from one country to another. So at an EU level, and as it has been discussed these two days of webinar, the average value of non-wood products, it's, it's rather unknown. Uh, and as we've been discussing, it's probably much higher than the existing 
estimated values. And we know that to give strength and political value to non-wood forest products, we need to change the system in some of those products. So we know that forests are a complex system uh, and the support of sustainable forest management must rely on its economical revenue to provide an effective management. Uh, we have been discussed that and I, I've mentioned it also in my presentation yesterday. So, but we know that in many countries in Europe, uh, non-wood forest products make a big part of that revenue. So we need to look with a positive perspective to the importance of non-wood forest products. And with this, uh, I can give my personal view and experience on the relevance of these products and value chains, particularly uh, in the south of Portugal, where I live and work, and where cork, pines, nuts, mushrooms, tourism and hunting are some among the sources of revenue for private forest owners, and they sustain highly valuable enterprises and value chains. So in my case, and in the case of many private forest owners, they are in fact the biggest income for our forests. So then we also need to consider non-wood forest products as a part of the ecosystem service provided by forests. Now that we are discussing the ecosystem services under the biodiversity strategy or the EU, EU forest strategy, non-wood forest products are among the various ecosystem services provided by forests. And when we are discussing the list of potential ecosystem services in these strategies, we need for sure to reinforce the role of non-wood forest products. I think this is pretty much the view that CPF and especially the private owners that we can give at this point from non-wood forest products. Excellent, thank you so much, Mr. Solares. So what is interesting is that now we have already four panel members and the perspectives that are coming in are quite clearly different, I would say. So where Mrs. Stephanie was pointing towards a number of uh, achievements uh, that have been um, become a reality in Italy, uh, even at a, a legislative, uh, uh, from a legislation perspective. Mrs. Polyakova then illustrated the situation in Ukraine. But then when we look at forests from a state forestry perspective, it's very clear that this societal role is coming in quite clearly as explicitated by Mr. Borkowski. While on the other hand, if you look at privately owned forests, it's the economic dimension that, that comes that we should not forget. And it is a reality as well. So that's already consisting of a very interesting melting pot. Now, before we proceed with this panel debate, let's bring in the final speaker of the final member of this group of people. And um, well, if we talk about the political agenda at a European level, Obviously, we have to look at the European Commission, without any doubt, and explore the perspective of the European Commission. We are therefore extremely pleased to have with us, as our final guest in this panel, Mr. Umberto Delgado Rosa, who is the Director of Natural Capital within the Director General of DG Environment of the European Commission. Mr. Delgado Rosa, welcome to this panel. We understand that you are Portuguese, so for sure, non-wood forest products such as cork, but also many others, must be very close to your heart. But in your capacity as the Director of Natural Capital, could you explain us what your perspective is on non-wood forest products and their current place in the political agenda of the European Commission? Good afternoon, Stephen. Thank you for inviting me and having me. I hope you listen to me well. I will say a word on cork, but let me indeed put it first in a wider perspective. And from the lenses we have in the European Commission, and particularly in the DG environment, now the lenses are that we are facing in the world and including in Europe, quite an ecological crisis in the sense that human development has attained many good things, but at the expense of the biosphere, the atmosphere, the ocean, land, and uh, we totally depend on the biosphere. So that's why we, ha we have this European Green Deal as the political response to this uh, situation, which is increasingly recognized by European society. So when we look to forests, we see that society is now expecting more from forests for climate, for nature and biodiversity, and for the bioeconomy, of course. So in this sense, 
going to um, products that go beyond wood is something that we have in mind for long, not because wood is not important, it's fundamental, uh, yeah, but it's really also, let's say, or the usual regular um, approach on uh, generating revenues from uh, forest products, while there are many others uh, which are often a win-win because they do not imply a priori the same level of uh, potential environmental impact as a tree felling may imply. Uh, you don't have the equivalent to a clear cut when we are addressing non-wood um, forest products. So we see them with a lot of interest. I, I would even say um, to say some words on ecosystem services. Of course, we all want to identify, recognize and value ecosystem services of several kinds some of which are not easily monetizable. Let's say what a forest can deliver on soil protection, on a carbon sink, clean air, clean water, is not necessarily something that uh, a forest owner can be easily rewarded for. So it's easier, of course, when we can use these harvestable products by one side, which very clearly can generate a, a revenue. Um, uh, but also uh, that also interests us, which is, let's say, the non-material wood, uh, non-wood products that were also referred, those related to ecotourism from bird watching to arborism or whatever non-extractive activity that forests also rely. So for us, we cherish very much this multifunctionality approach of forests indeed, including timber and beyond timber. Um, I've heard the challenges ahead, several of them. I can tell you this um, debate and this white paper is rather opportune because we will be coming with a EU forest strategy this year. By, by mid of the year, we expect to have it out, out. Actually, there's a public consultation ongoing now, if I'm not mistaken, until the 16th of April. So do bring your inputs. And it's very good for us to have this a perception of the challenges that you have identified, several of which I've heard and which uh, actually um, can help us in, in elaborating the forest strategy. I said I would say a word on cork. Yes, indeed, you know, uh, Portuguese do know cork and that's something they know is that cork comes from a rather sustainable ecosystem. You don't cut the tree to take out cork and you can only take the cork every nine to 10 years. So it's something really sustainable. We were shocked some time ago to see some campaigns on alternative caps for bottles that would label cork as unsustainable, while indeed it maintains a fantastic agroforestry system with a lot of wild nature, including the Iberian lynx is now returning with some help from forest owners, including in these montados or the as, uh, uh, as in Spain. So uh, for me to see this non-wood uh, products coming in, which are often not fully understand, understandable or recognized everywhere in Europe is very important for our politi political setting. Some of the challenges I think are related to the farm to fork strategy in terms of the value chains, labeling, price setting, traceability, standards, food regulations, all this links nicely with the deliverables of the food farm at the farm to fork strategy. And the others, I expect the forest strategy, as I say, to probably be giving a hand. Maybe I stop here, there's a chance to discuss further. Thank you. Excellent. Now, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Delgado Rosa. Uh, well, indeed, let, let us continue around. And perhaps I would like to return to Mrs. Uh, Stephanie, if, uh, if that's okay. And what I would like to ask her is the following question. I think it's, it's abundantly clear that, that Italy has this uh, number of successful stories uh, or success cases in non wood forest products. And you, depict, you depicted a couple of them yourself with this uh, rather new legislation, etc. So that's wonderful. So there are good examples of public-private partnerships, also in tourism, this, this taxation of it, etc. Now, perhaps a question for you. It's not always easy to... Uh, sì, grazie. Yeah. yeah, so for you, what have been the success factors to achieve these successes? Could you explore a bit on how Italy has basically achieved these and mastered these challenges? Tell us. 
Eh, allora, il, credo, credo che eh, uno dei più grandi fattori di successo che hanno consentito di varare delle norme e una pianificazione uh, some laws and regulations that favored but we are still at the beginning and there is still so much that can be done and so much will be done over the next few years one of the biggest factors was the great the great turning point of the tables Tavoli di filiera at our ministry with the representation of the regions. The, the tables of the value chain divided for each topic. So, forestal chain, so uh, fruit chain, so medical plants chain, divided into these different tables. So, there was a collective participation of all stakeholders that are such. And to discuss and bring in their own perspective to obtain a final synthesis that includes everyone's interest in the best possible way. This is how the rule of uh, medical plants was born, which I mentioned previously. This is how the plan for the chain of truffle was born that anticipated the new regulation on truffle that is still being discussed at the parliament. This is how the initiatives were born in order to set the guidelines for the management of these product chains entrusted to the regions subsequently. I believe that this is uh, one of a correct interpretation of how co manage the legislative and planning process, respecting each single responsibility. The ministry can't be exempted from being the drafter of legislation, laws, and regulations. The private landowner is not exempted from showing his needs, the processor also, and all of them, if they sit together, they can find a solution together. The new forestal law was anticipated by a four-year work by the forestal roundtable in order to set a a law text, a law draft, then some events, parliamentary events, didn't make it possible to translate it directly. But I think that that was the most positive experience. We are still working in the ministry with this uh, concerted mode, also using all of the drafts that come out these tables. We have also subgroups that prepare the draft and then we'll listen the opinions of our stakeholders and we discuss these opinions all together. Now, of course, there are some difficulties due to COVID and self-distancing and difficulty to discuss remotely, but we managed also with 90 participants, as you are doing today, with a similar system and we are trying to continue along this virtuous approach that, in our opinion, is, uh, I think, I, I think, is the reason why we changed the system of working and also the system of listening to the needs. We have also other systems, the mechanisms were also published on the website by Forestal Ministry, but the initiative of the different thematic tables is a virtuous mechanism, is a virtuous system. So you point towards basically engaging stakeholders as a key ingredient, a critical success factor, but I can imagine at the same time that might be quite some challenge because it presupposes that there is enough trust for these people to be part of uh, this exercise and to work in a partnership model. So how did you create this climate of, of trust? Because it's wonderful that you managed to do so. So how did you succeed in this? 
E diciamo che well, let's say that uh, the, the initial impact was not easy. The differences uh, in, in a few instances, of course, there are still some differences. When you can find a balance point, you interrupt the works, you rethink about it, you update after a few weeks. Meanwhile, you elaborate some uh, proposals altogether, some um, mitigation works on some specific points and with patience with politeness and we are lucky because I, I work with a, a team that under this perspective Mr. Yenerica is listening, the manager in charge of this, Mr. Manzo in charge of also the run, the run table on the productive side, not the forestal side and other department. All of them are extremely polite persons, able to continue discussions with their purposes in mind, but respecting everyone's opinions. Time is also necessary. Time is necessary to ripen awareness and understand the difference between bringing a problem in, finding a solution, writing the decree that is necessary to get there. It's not that easy. It's not an easy task, but the more you try this approach, the easier it is to get into the real debate. So it's, it's about taking small steps, gradually build up step by step, together with uh, all parties involved. This level of trust that allows you then to uh, basically take this decision. It's a marvelous example. It, it shows basically what can be achieved at the national level. Now, that's quite a challenge, but I would like to turn over to Mrs. Polyakova again. Um, during this policy forum, uh, also today, even yesterday, we had this, this clear messages of the importance of the availability of data. Uh, I think Jim Chamberlain was really advocating, we need data, we need to base our decisions on data, and these data need to be reliable. So that is not always obvious, that is not always easy to have this data, so it is a key challenge and a prerequisite for evidence-based decision making. So, what are your experiences in Ukraine on this huge challenge of data availability? Could uh, you show thank us? you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it is really a challenge uh, also for Ukraine. Uh, we have more or less uh, reliable data uh, on the um, uh, state uh, uh, forest and almost nothing about uh, communal forest, uh, as well as uh, nothing about consumption uh, and uh, request uh, for non-wood forest products uh, from local population. And I'd like to say that uh, it is a common challenge uh, for European countries as well. Uh, last year it was published a um, report uh, prepared uh, within the uh, forest, uh, forest Europe process. And uh, nevertheless, uh, it is one of the criteria of uh, SFM. Uh, only 32 countries uh, from uh, 46 uh, were able uh, to report uh, on uh, non-wood forest products uh, and uh, marketable place uh, of uh, this product. Over to you. Thank you. So, well, that's nice to have this information on uh, Ukraine. Now, what, would, what I would like to do now, perhaps, is switch to Mr. Borkovsky. And you mentioned, Mr. Borkovsky, you mentioned this societal role, so to speak, of, of forests, especially state forests. Now, we all know society is facing severe challenges. Huh? Mr. Delgado Rosa already indicated several of them. So there is climate change, impacts, loss of biodiversity, the sustainability objectives we have and that have been discussed also uh, in the other sessions of this uh, policy forum. It's quite clear that forests have a role to play in addressing these societal challenges. But it also means that society probably starts to look at forests or should start to look at forests with new eyes. So perhaps expectations are changing for, for, on forests. So 
what does it mean, this, cha this changing expectations? So what does it mean specifically for state forests then and for non-wood forest products, obviously? Could you elaborate on that? Indeed, yes, you ask the right uh, question. And then uh, with the development of so-called participatory society, but on the other hand, with the development of the new modern communication channels, uh, including social media, uh, we, we are witnessing actually a sort of revolution when it comes to the perception of forest, of forest management, of the role of forestry by the society at large. At the same time, um, you know, we traditionally also state forestry services used to be focused on its main purpose and uh, reason for being that was the the management uh, of, 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 of forest ecosystems and making them con continuously growing, developing, resilient in their own run, run and then uh, definitely not shrinking. So, so we also have to uh, undergo certain revolution when it comes even to the skills to inform society and then to be, to be uh, able to on the one hand, to, re to respond to the growing societal uh, expectations, but on the other hand, you know, the skills to, to, to explain actually what are we doing in forests and why actually in this way, not in the other, is another story. So communication gets more and more attention and gets more and more importance. Just, just briefly to, you know, you know, to give you uh, and maybe also referring to what uh, Mr. Delgado Rosa mentioned, that now probably it's the time to transfer a little bit or to turn from traditionally wood-based use uh, forestry into something that, 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 that leads us towards benefiting from the other functions. Of course, but at the same time, we have to clearly explain to people to let them understand why we do manage forests? Because you know, forestry, especially in state forests, it's it's per se not for logging. Logging is only a, I would say, a part of a variety of silvicultural operations. And very often, before the forest is is mature enough to even to go with the final cut, understood as the logging by the most of us, we have to to introduce a number of, of operations, which are also, uh, which we call tending operations. The purpose of which is to, to keep the forest growing, to keep the forest vital, to keep the forest resilient. But we also log trees in the meantime, sometimes thinner, sometimes uh, thicker, uh, different number uh, in different uh, like way this, is, this extraction takes place. So altogether, I believe that one of the biggest challenges today is to explain to people that even if they see that there is a logging going on, it does not necessarily mean deforestation, overexploitation, or a kind of negative impact on forestry because this is how silviculture has been organized. But then I also wanted to say that all what I'm saying is, is a part of like connecting vessel system. So we have to, to invest in, 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 a par, in part of the asset. We have to make a benefit in another part of the asset in order to be able to deliver in the third or fourth spot. So, so if we lose this kind of understanding, this, this holistic uh, global understanding of the whole forestry system, then we, we most probably won't be able to either to explain well or either to deliver in the, in, in, in the future because you know also climate challenge is, is a big challenge today, but it's not only for the society this challenge. This challenge is also for us. We need to adapt forests to the changing climatic conditions and the way to adapt them is by applying uh, scientifically, scientifically based and well kind of thoroughly thought and then well planned silvicultural measures because this is the way. Thank you. Thank you so much for this explanation. It, it reminds me a little bit of, of uh, I think, during the opening statements yesterday, yesterday morning, I think it was either Mr. Palahi or Mr. Ramechstein, I think one of the two made the statement that we, we as a society, we need to stop looking at a forest through fossil fuel based lenses, basically, and, and then need to look with completely different eyes at, at forests. 
And I think you're absolutely right that communication is going to be key in that, engaging with the public, right? Shall we perhaps take a step to Mr. Soares? Uh, you have been an active uh, member, in fact, of, of all the sessions so far. Huh? Um, so perhaps the question for you then is, there have been so many challenges for non-wood forest products that we have been discussing earlier today, but yesterday as well. Huh? So especially in the three sessions we had so far, there were challenges basically at each topic that was being considered. But if, if we take the perspective of private forest owners, what do you think is then probably the biggest challenge that private forest owners are facing? Could you elaborate on that? Well, Stephen, it's, it's not easy to pick up um, the challenge, but I think I have some ideas that, that I could try to put from the perspective of the, for the private forest owners. And there is a challenge regarding non-wood forest products is to find the balance approach between allowing the society to enjoy these products. And we have been discussing some of those examples like picking up mushrooms or berries for family consumption, but getting the balance about providing also a possible resource of revenue to the forest owner and respecting forest ownership's rights. And such balance approach must be found at the national or regional level, as it depends a lot, and we've been discussing that, on the culture, on the history and legislation already in place in different member states. But another challenge is to improve uh, the, the knowledge of the value of these non-wood forest products. Over the last years, uh, they have gained importance for the society. Uh, and as we've discussed a lot during the forum, uh, we need to get more insights on their value that could help to communicate to the public and find the balance uh, that I mentioned above. But here I have to come back to my personal experience again. And in some non-wood forest products, we can discuss many key challenges during the value chain. But if we don't focus enough on adaptation and mitigation to climate change and the consequences to abiotic and biotic challenges, then the oscillation in what concerns quantity and quality of the supply of some non-wood product forests might put in risk the future of the market of some of those products. And I can talk for experience in what concerns cork and pinus nuts quality and quantity. So I do consider that adaptation and mitigation is one of the most important key challenge for some private forest owners, considering that challenges are different from one country to another and that climate change affects now more some known wood product forests and countries than others. So this is pretty much one of the key challenges that I think we are facing nowadays. Thank you. So, well, if you look at this different perspective, it's very clear that engaging with stakeholders, building this trust with these actors and involving them in, in decision-making or preparing for decision-making uh, is, is quite a clear challenge. There is indeed the challenge of data, and I think that these two first have clearly been backed up by the survey we did just before lunch, where these items of data availability, etc., have a clearly high score when we asked people on, on the importance or the impact, the estimated impact of measures in that direction. So this is clearly again restating the same challenge. Um, the issue of communication basically goes in the same direction. And then we have indeed these challenges related to, on the one hand, uh, forest ownership rights, but then climate change, mitigation, uh, adaptation. It's very clear that there's a lot that can be done at the national level, as uh, we, we heard from Mrs. Uh, Stephanie, and for sure it involves working together also at the regional level, but at the same time, it's abundantly clear that you can only do so much at the national level and that many of these issues probably need to be taken up at a higher level, which brings me back to Mr. Delgado Rosa. So if you look at all these challenges, I mean, many of these touch up upon the core of natural capital, your policy area. So, well, how do you then look at the challenges or what is the challenge that you face then? Could you explain us? Yes, um, some challenges are actually the same as referred by other speakers, but let me start where is the main challenge. And the main challenge is that we keep eroding our natural capital 
water, air, land, uh, soil, and taking it for granted as if it is eternal or uh, as if we don't need to take it into account. It will just be there. And this ecological crisis I've referred is an evidence that we are going too far in destroying the basis of sustainable development, which is the biosphere, the environment. So we are in this situation, let's say, in terms of challenges, is addressing this, namely from, well, from the side of climate change, that's well up in the political agenda for long and public attention. But there's something, there's a new uh, sister a challenge that came in, which is biodiversity loss, which is now getting as crucial to tackle as climate and which are uh, intertwined. You cannot address climate without addressing nature and vice versa. So the main challenge I would say is we have now this uh, duty to tackle biodiversity loss. We want the EU to lead, the EU leads by example. That's why we have now a EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 that I do think it's the most ambitious the world has ever seen and that the EU will uh, promote it irrespectively of what happens internationally as to set the example. Now, where's the challenge? The challenge is the main drivers of biodiversity loss are now well known and ranked. The first one is land use change, and by the way, sea use change also. The second is overexploitation. The third is climate change itself. The fourth is pollution of all kinds, and the fifth is invasive alien species. So how can one, from a biodiversity policy angle, address all this? That is the challenge. And in terms of land use, of course, uh, forest, forests do have an advantage in forestry, which is if you want to manage them sustainable, you need to have a long-term perspective that favors sustainability. But this is far from saying that every, everywhere on forests, including European forests, we have sustainability. We have faced many cases, namely in agriculture, but also in forest forestry of a, an increased intensification that does take a toll on, um, on the environment, on biodiversity particularly, and some of the ecosystem services. So what we are now trying to steer, and this cannot be done without stakeholders for sure, is uh, approaches to forestry that do allow to, to extract everything we need from them, including wood, but in a way that is closer to nature and under biodiversity criteria that allow this replenishment and maintenance also of nature uh, and biodiversity. So this um, approach to nature-based solutions, natural climate solutions kicking in is something that is uh, getting more important. I can also say we need to give more space for nature for our own sake. That's why you will find in the biodiversity strategy reference to increasing protected areas. Protected areas can be perfectly uh, adaptable or managed in such a way as to keep using the territory in a way that is um, adequate for nature conservation. Non-forest food products are very uh, relatively easily to uh, adapt to this approach. We are also coming in with restoration targets this year in a legally binding initiative announced in the biodiversity strategy. And these are an example of challenges. Maybe I could still say a final word on this issue of communication and awareness. I do think it's a big challenge, uh, a very important one. For instance, I find it concerning to find some millennials, some young people that treat um, tree cutting as something that should never be done. And this uh, very obviously does not make sense. So that's an approach on explaining what is a forest, what it means. But this goes on, the, uh, on, on both ways. We also need to communicate with foresters and, uh, and the forest owners these new approaches from society on climate and biodiversity, nam namely explaining that when we speak uh, nature conservation in forests, that's still management. It's not something different from it. And sometimes we, we see this split too marked between the two, commu two communities and we should um, bridge the gap. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your explanation. Well, this almost closes this first part and we would definitely uh, make enough 
make sure that we have enough time to talk about policy actions and the white paper. But we, uh, we noticed that there is a question coming in and we have time perhaps for only one question. And I would like to hand the word to Enrico, who's going to ask a question on farm to fork, I suppose. But Enrico, there's only time for one question because I've, I see that you have already other questions as well. So let's, let's go for that question on farm to fork. Enrico, please. It's a question from one of the attendees, one of the, I don't know. Enrico? No, no, wait, wait the same one. No, sorry, because of the mask uh, for, for the COVID. Anyway, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, to, um, uh, I, I don't know, wh whoever can, can answer. So uh, a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one is uh, how can we deal with the free access to the picker and the fully private uh, uh, forest ownership? I mean, if there are no pickers that goes inside the forest to collect mushroom, truffle, uh, medicinal aromatic plants, berries, and whatever, um, how can the supply chain be sustained on the economical point of view? If uh, the forest owner want to have the largest, the largest piece uh, of the value of the chain, the chain will disappear right immediately. Second point. No, no. Let, let's 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 uh, do this, and only one question, because otherwise it's going to be too complicated. So, who would like to address? To who would like to respond to this question? Would that be perhaps something for Mr. Uh, Suarez? Well, I, I can address the, 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 the final part of the question, and that, that's very important. It's, it's a matter of value chain. Uh, and if you consider the value chain that we have for many of the known wood forest products, it is definitely not on the, pro on the forest owner, the biggest part of the, the value chain. Uh, so uh, I think it, it's a difference. I think that it must be well distributed. I think it should be a win-win for everyone in the, in the sector. But definitely, and if we consider, for instance, cork or the pinus nuts, it's definitely not the, the large uh, parts of the revenue. It's, it's not on the private owner. Um, of course, it needs to be well distributed so that uh, the private owner that is indeed responsible for the sustainable forest management and to create the habitats that could give uh, a supply of quality and quantity uh, or for the future of the non-wood forest products that we are considered, of course, it needs to be some, some interest in economical interests to make sure that the environmental and the social sustainability is granted. Because if not, we will see things that we see uh, in many parts of Europe, that it's uh, a forest abandoned, uh, it's a forest that it's not managed, it's a forest that it's totally devastated by wildfires, and it's totally uh, that some parts, even in Portugal, I could say that a huge part of the Portuguese forest, no one knows who's the ownership, because if there is not a, a distribution of revenue uh, on the, on the non-wood forest products, uh, it will be a lack of management. So I don't consider that uh, the big part it's on the forest owner. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Soares. Uh, I know, Enrico, you have many more questions, but I need to be very selective because I, we still have uh, a lot of things to do and I need to manage time. My apologies for that. I see uh, Mr. Sven Walter has also raised his hand. Perhaps a very short question and a short, very short answer. I try to be very short. Uh, we thank talked you. about a lot of challenges, but the main challenge maybe of today was not address the, the global pandemic. So my question would be if any of the panelists would have examples on how the pandemic influenced the, the non-wood forest product sectors, such as cork, and how it could contribute to building back better. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a question. Now, who wants to respond to this in a very short way, please? Well, I, I can just respond that when it was the first wave, uh, we were very, very concerned about the restrictions uh, of people going to work uh, on farms, on, on the, in the forests, and especially because much of the manpower uh, comes from other countries that, that not the ones uh, where the, the extraction is being made. But, uh, well, it, since the, the extraction of cork, it's done in the summer, we caught that, uh, uh, that flat line of the COVID, 
so it was not a big issue. But uh, for instance, now we are collecting from the trees the pinus nuts, uh, and we are facing problems uh, to get manpower to do that. Uh, it's, uh, at least from this part of manpower, uh, it's it's a problem, even though it depends on the seasonality of the of the non wood forest product that we are talking about. But of course, that the 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 break that we have in the economy uh, and in the cork is it's pretty much affected uh, uh, by the economy. So of course, the there is a difference in the value chain to everyone. Okay, thank you so much. I see that also Piotr Borkowski has raised his hand. So a short answer from your side, please. Thank you very much. Very shortly, uh, also state forest organizations got under the impact. And then I would say it was kind of double kind impact. On the one hand, we got under the same lockdown restrictions as the others. And then Antonio already referred to the manpower. And then we are also employing contractors or, or workers. So that was also customers. Uh, the, the, the supply chains got under the impact of COVID. But in other more social related uh, result of the COVID was that uh, more people started using maybe not exactly non-wood products, but uh, but these ecosystem services and uh, forest functions. We we could observe even you know around Brussels in the famous forest this one quite high penetration of of of, of citizens on uh, of of uh, Brussels inhabitants who are benefiting from from this resource because they 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 have limitations somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you also for being short because we well I have to do some time management and I suggest we just move on with our panel debate and introduce the second block. Um, well, after having explored your perspectives and understanding these challenges that have been discussed, so the question obviously is, it's good to know the challenges, but then we need to decide on what needs to happen, right? And in the white paper that Inazio has introduced, we have a list of policy actions. So there are several sections, each containing a number of very clear suggestions and many of them of these have been discussed this morning and even yesterday and we had a process a voting process on that and these policy actions are in the domain of securing the conservation and sustainable supply of longwood forest products it's about building competitive and equitable uh, value chains it's about the transparency data and information flows on longwood forest products and it's about creating these enabling conditions, which is basically a kind of a container argument, if you like, for coherence of institutional action, financial support, support innovation, knowledge transfer, capacity building, things like this. So enabling conditions, I would say. Now, I would like to hear from you, knowing your challenges that you are faced with in, in basically in the perspective that you present, what do you, th what do you think needs to happen and how does it link to this white paper uh, is there a specific set of actions that you say yes from our perspective it needs to be predominant predominantly uh, that part of the action that has priority or maybe it's something completely different let's let's check with all of you could we start perhaps with mrs uh, thank you Stephen. Uh, very much i'd like to congratulate you with a uh, very comprehensive and very useful uh, white paper first of all i think that uh, all options provided are relevant uh, from my perspective uh, i think that we should start first of all from uh, rising uh, awareness about the importance uh, of um, uh, non-wood uh, forest products and benefits uh, uh, for uh, state enterprises uh, for increasing uh, use of it. Then, uh, of course, uh, when we will have uh, a good view um, to in, uh, and um, uh, we will be able to encourage uh, um, uh, state forest enterprises uh, to better use uh, non-wood forest products, uh, we will need uh, enable condition, of course. Um, we need to, to encourage uh, forest authorities uh, to support forest enterprises and uh, create some kind of uh, incentives. Uh, and then uh, again, uh, what is stated in your white paper, uh, we need to look uh, into market. 
um, access to market uh, as well as uh, to promote uh, um, produ uh, products to receive it from uh, non wood forest products. Of course, uh, it's still an issue, especially for Ukraine. I know uh, that uh, our enterprises producing different types of uh, products. Uh, they are facing significant problem with entering uh, uh, with entering uh, market uh, and selling their products. Thank you. Over to Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now let's immediately switch to Mrs. Uh, Stefani. So, if you consider this Italian level, the challenges, but also the achievements, huh? and, and then if you look at this white paper with its policy actions, are there actions that you say, yes, this would really help us uh, in Italy to even take this next step and, and achieve uh, or, or uh, achieve the next step, so to speak? Huh? Could you give a comment on that? Sì, uh, ho trovato il libro bianco molto interessante, ricco e denso. Il libro bianco è molto interessante. I agree with a lot of the suggestions of the white paper and Italian realities well represented in the white paper. So I don't know, I can choose among the suggestions because they're, they're, they're all interesting. But I think that as far as Italy is concerned, we have a very big problem of unknown owners and it's very difficult to identify specific policies in this sense because very often the owners, forest owners, do not know that they actually own that forest. Uh, in terms of because we have problems with heritage, also for, for, for all pieces of land, all portions of forest. So the first point, which might, which is very interesting for Italy, is to imagine some supply chain agreements between owners, foragers, users, processors, and the ways in which, and the places, and to establish the places where these agreements can take place in order to have an aggregation process together with the value chain, in order to have an effective aggregation about the uh, peculiarities uh, of each territory. The supply chain agreements are uh, a, new, a new thing in Italy. It worked so far successfully in, the, in agriculture. But if our recovery resilience national plan, which is being discussed in Italy, of the last days, if, if, we, if it will remain, we will have funds to expand the experience of the supply chain agreements in the poorest, stock in the poorest and the fishery sectors. A second aspect, which is fundamental, is the uh, transmission of of knowledge and skills and competencies. We have skills in the harvesting, in the processing that must be, that must have, uh, must be given value. We have to transmit those skills to new generations and we need incentives. Young, youngsters should be interested to do something if they want them to work in this field. But this transmission of knowledge of skills is fundamental in order to hold in order to hold on to this to the values that are represented for our sector. But at the same time, younger generation can make the products more attractive. Because they have the skills to do so, they can use technology. And on the other hand, we should consider the global aspect represented by the possibilities 
of a sustainable management of forests and their multifunctionality. So we have areas for timber production, for example, and we have to do this without having a deep negative impact on the places where we do this. So in Italy, we have to uh, do something more to promote the reality of the forest in all our territories, according to a long-term plan, which we identified as the best one. For, for example, uh, hills which are not too big nor too small. In this way, we think that in the new pack, a big chapter, a, a great chapter of this perspective, in the next seven years, should be dedicated to this product that gives value to our supply chain and identify the challenges of the from farm to fork under a new perspective but a perspective that can give value and improvement. You are also referring to this, this uh, importance of, of maintaining the competences uh, and it, it beautifully links to the messages uh, stated by Mr. Chamberlain yesterday on the legacy. It's a heritage matter, basically. It, it, it's about culture uh, and we should cherish this. So this is very clear. So thank you for your position on this. Uh, Mr. Soares, I would like to turn to you now and perhaps could you switch hats in the sense that could you share with us the role that the civil group of forestry could play? Because yes, we discussed this bringing in stakeholders at the national level. Italy was a beautiful example on this, but you're doing something similar, I would say, with the civil dialogue, uh, the civil group on forestry. How could this play a role in this, in this policy actions? Could you share your opinion on this with us, please? Well, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, and despite their relevance, non-wood forest products are rather missing from the EU political agenda. Uh, and these this have not been addressed recently at CDG, at least since I'm a chair, uh, despite some information that is being given by the agroforest stakeholders. But they could be discussed if in line with the EU political agenda. Uh, this forum was, uh, and is, it is, of course, a perfect opportunity to bring this topic to the debate. So the CDG could possibly discuss on this topic and recommendations if they are related to the ongoing EU policy developments. Uh, as an example, um, I do consider that the discussion of non wood forest products could be part of the more general discussion on ecosystem services and the, the, the possible payments. And we have we had yesterday the presentation of Mr. Maro Ponelli that made a very clear presentation uh, on the importance of non-wood forest products in many EU policies, but especially uh, in what concerns the CDG in the new EU forest strategy. Namely, um, he, he described what concerns the multifunctional role of forests, the importance of eco-services, uh, provision of food and, and medicinal materials, and especially the role of sustainable forest management, among others. And considering this, I do think that during the discussion of the new EU forest strategy in the CDG, that we could see in the agenda the role of non-wood forest products in, new in this new strategy discussion. And we cannot forget that the CDG is named Forestry and Cork. So it's clear the importance given by DG Agri to this subject. So let's see the development of this important policy forum that we are finishing today on the future implementation in the several EU policies that could consider a major role to non-wood forest products by improving the one that it's being dedicated so far. Well, th thank you for your openness to, uh, to consider this non inclusion of non-wood forest products uh, as an area on which also the civil group could uh, play a role. So that's very, uh, very welcome, I would say. Now, uh, perhaps let's take a look at Mr. Borkowski now with if, if you look at, from your perspective, at these policy actions, many things have already been said, 
and uh, it seems that many of us are going to agree with this policy actions, but if there would be a priority that you would be selecting out of these because they are of particular, because it would be of particular relevance for a state for us, basically, what type of action or which action would that be? Thank you very much. Indeed, indeed, a lot of uh, has been said already of, of really good, 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 uh, argu good um, examples and arguments. Uh, what I would say, one of the key issues to to to, to solve also for the for the future, especially looking from the European or EU perspective, would be to further work for consistency and coherence in policy making, and that's why. For example, in Eustafor, we are attaching so much attention today and we have so, so, so many expectations from the upcoming forest strategy that the commission is currently working on. Uh, why I'm saying, of course, uh, since forests are very much different depending from or in which biogeographical region we look at them, uh, they have been regulated by uh, sometimes quite different national or even subnational regional uh, legislation. Uh, and however, what the EU could and I mean has been uh, contributing with was this kind of subsidiarity and additional uh, additionality for all those elements were uh, certain coordinated action among the member states would be required also. Uh, acting on a certain common platform to exchange, to, to, to make benchmarking, to, to share experiences, then the strategy would be the perfect uh, solution. And of course, when we, when we refer to the strategy, uh, we refer to certain um, guiding policy document, but then the consequence of the strategy, for example, uh, is, is that there are certain uh, dialogue uh, platforms functioning under it, uh, which are coordinated, for example, by, by the European Commission. And then I can only concert with Antonio, who said that, uh, let's hope that the new strategy will give like a new impetus also for, among others, this civil dialogue group on forestry and court, which will be even more efficiently than so far uh, used uh, by the Commission, by us, also for the member states, for example, there is the Standing Forestry Committee. So I believe that these structures uh, should and could be even make more like uh, playing their role and then uh, for, for the benefit of all of us. Very quickly, maybe if I can refer to these actions, which are then uh, somehow uh, highlighted in the, in, the, in, the, in the white paper, but also in the manifesto. Of course, uh, the first of it is conservation and sustainable supply of, 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 of uh, non-wood uh, forest products. I would say that since these non-wood forest products are a part of the entire forestry system, I would even say that even more important is that to develop and sustainably supply these non-wood forest products in the future. Because, you know, conservation is a sort of passive uh, meaning of, of the whole, whereas we need to mobilize even more than today. And then we can, and there is a great potential to mobilize now these non-wood forest products uh, from a sustainably managed forest. And then it was also uh, a lot said about the proper means for valuation. And then when it comes to kind of scientific uh, description of the whole concept of uh, payments for ecosystem services, I think this, this part is quite advanced. We need now to see the workable, implementable uh, means to, to put this into the practice. And then why I'm saying, uh, especially for us, I, and then I understand that the, there are different approaches or uh, certain differences even among the different ownership types. What, what we would like to see from the state forest perspective, we don't need based forestry systems on subsidies because that would be rather kind of uh, not long-term looking. Uh, whereas what we need is only to guarantee that everywhere where, for example, we will be expected to withdraw from certain action which is related to, 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 to generating income from timber sales. We need workable solution to replace this part of the income, sometimes maybe by, uh, by certain compensation, even in short term, 
to allow us to turn into the new systems because we cannot de deviate from healthy economies in forestry. And uh, last point I wanted to make, it will be a little bit also what Mr. Uh, Delgado Rosa said that now we are sort of witnessing the uh, eroding of national cap natural capital. I would say yes and no, and that's why we need a, a very good information systems and good data to base the policy analysis and the future uh, setting of future objectives on. Because, for example, over recent uh, weeks, I could see even on Twitter or on, on other uh, channels in Spain, last hundred of years, tremendous increase of forest resources. In France as well. Yesterday, we had the discussion, internal discussion in in, in, in Ustafor, in Latvia, tremendous the, the development of forests over the last hundred of years. So it's not only like we, we are eroding the natural capital, but then I, when planning for the future, also how to face the, the climate challenge, we have also think about kind of equal distribution of burdens among the sectors, who should do what to, 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 to make the full uh, contribution to this overall objective of climate fit Europe 2050. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Piotr. Well, it's, it's very clear, if you are talking policy actions, sooner or later, we are going to end up at the European level or at the level of the European Commission, obviously. Now, yesterday we had Mr. Poinelli uh, with us and he was uh, quite available and we were so pleased that he could be with us to explain basically to depict this political landscape of this upcoming, the existing, but also the upcoming uh, strategies. And this was very useful and very interesting for us. But my question to you, Mr. Uh, Delgado Rosa, would perhaps be, uh, could you elaborate or, or, or explain how you feel these actions of the white paper would fit with these upcoming strategies? Yes, I would like to address that, give you some telegrams on the actions. And if time allows, I see a couple of, of questions in the chat directed to me that in the end I would also like to tackle. So I would say of, of the several elements of the right paper that have captured my attention. Uh, those that relate to sustainable use are important for us, sustainable use of non-wood uh, forest products, namely, for instance, ensuring that people that harvest do have the knowledge and expertise to harvest responsibly. So this sustainable harvesting is a, a very fundamental aspect, including from not having negative impacts on forest biodiversity. There's also an issue that I think is very diversified, which is the variety of regulations on access and harvesting rights uh, in the different member states. We don't know what are the good ones or bad ones, of course, but having a bit of, of uh, a list, an overview of these different approaches and what they imply uh, can be relevant for us. I would also refer that we are aware of the impacts of climate change on vegetation zones, on uh, forest risks and deliverables, and the uh, EU adaptation strategy is taking uh, a look into this precisely. Now on information, of course, information will be a key uh, element of the forest strategy for sure. We have set up this forest information system for Europe that was launched uh, last year in an international forest conference. And indeed, I can tell you that I, I can imagine data on non wood forest products included also in this system. Then on funding, I do think uh, that's a very important enabled condition. We have already a program, the LIFE program, uh, which is the environment and climate specific EU program that has funded projects on resins, truffles, cork oak forests, ecotourism, et cetera. But I do think it's very important to keep watch on the rural development programs. And this is because, you know, this is within the common agriculture policy and forests in not agriculture and sometimes it risks falling between the cracks. So we are very interested on having uh, information and ideas uh, on how we can tackle better uh, forest investments in rural development. Um, and finally, as a point that uh, was also in the uh, initial presentation, this issue of nature and landscape conservation and how it links to forests. For us, it's very important that indeed forests can be managed, used uh, and harvested, but also uh, in protected areas in a way which can be adapted to the conservation objectives uh, of the area, which uh, we think is uh, easy to get. Now, I would, if you allow me, reply to the two questions in the chat. 
Uh, one is on the how do we perceive the risks of land management abandonment, uh, namely in the Mediterranean context. I say, well, uh, when we say Mediterranean forests uh, do not uh, face uh, threats from intensification, it depends on the view. If you imagine even aged uh, monocultures of exotic species for timber production, that's rather intensification. It can be managed, of course, to reduce risks but it cannot avoid impacts. And in some cases, we just have some private owners that have put some fast growing trees, hoping that they grow and then the forest fire come, uh, comes in. So I still see a, a link with the intensification uh, possible. But it's very important wh what was said in the question, which is um, uh, land management as a risk. I would say it's ecosystem management or bad ecosystem man management as the, that is the risk because where we, we see a loss of risk, namely for forest fires in Mediterranean context, is when we don't have any longer a resilient ecosystem with all its components. We have pines, shrubs, land abandonment, eucalyptus, and then the conditions, the climate conditions get worse. So I think we need to revisit the ecosystem in fauna and flora. Remember, getting back to cork, cork is a product of fire. That's the, the cork tree evolved to have cork because the fire is an element in the Mediterranean ecosystems. So we need to put back the kind of Mediterranean ecosystems that are resilient enough. Maybe my final point is the second question on active management uh, as the, the way forward, let's say, I would put it this way. And there are two extreme views related to nature and forests. One extreme view is only when there's no human, we have value, nature knows better. That's wrong. The second extreme view, only when you have human hands actively managing and intervening, we have value. And that's also wrong. It's actually a spectrum. It depends on what you want from the forest and the, in the, uh, and the context. Um, uh, nature conservation is not passive management. It's a different approach to management, which can be also pretty active. Thank you. Thank you so much also for taking up these questions. Well, in fact, I, I really have the feeling that it would be quite easy for, for us in the, in the panel to just keep on talking for at least another hour. The, the topic is fascinating. It's clear that all of you have so many stories, so many insights, and you're willing to share them with all of us. And that's, that's very clear and, and, and very beautiful also to be, uh, to be part of this. Unfortunately, I have to look at the time. The clock is... Uh, telling me what it is telling me, and I have to take that into account. Uh, and I see there are still uh, many comments uh, in the chat, uh, so people definitely agree with uh, the messages all of you have bringing. Um, you know that there is going to be this uh, manifesto as a document. Uh, we don't have the time anymore to explore on this, but I would definitely like to ask all of you to consider the document, to consider it, see where the value of it, how this could be put uh, at, at, at best use from your perspective, because that's uh, definitely the purpose of creating such a document, not a document for the sake of having a document, but because we would like to make and state and uh, mobilize uh, actors to basically help the non-wood forest products uh, value chains. So with that being said, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to all five panel members, it was not only the time that you spent here with us the afternoon, many of you have decided to also observe, be part of uh, the previous sessions in this panel forum. Uh, you were all available for just these conversations we had to get to know each other, explore the topics and the messages. Uh, all this is, is part of being a panel member, but it means it's not just this one hour, it's much more. We are well aware of that. We are well aware that all of you have very busy agendas. So we really appreciated your presence. And I would like to really thank you, all five of you. Thank you for being part of this uh, panel discussion. And as this is now the end of the panel debate, I suggest we take a very short break and that we look at a couple of these uh, very short videos we have because they just offer so nice insights and they depict the reality of this non forest products. Gerard, whenever you are ready to launch a video, just go ahead.
encontramos-nos na zona norte de Vinhais, em plena área protegida do Parque Natural de Montesinho. Nesta zona, situada na terra fria transmontana, a agricultura e a floresta ainda caminham lado a lado. Na nossa opinião, grande parte do potencial desta região reside no aproveitamento multifuncional dos espaços florestais. O Castanheiro tem um elevado peso na economia local. Os Conselhos de Vinhais de Bragança são os maiores produtores de castanha a nível nacional, o que faz com que esta cultura seja a mais representativa na região. O carvalho negral é fundamental para a manutenção de inúmeras espécies de fauna e flora, como sejam os animais de caça maior, javali, corso e viado, ou espécies arbustivas e herbáceas de orla de bosque. Estes ecossistemas são propícios à realização de várias atividades. A associação destes ecossistemas levou a que o mel do Parque Natural de Montesinho fosse classificado como uma das sete maravilhas doces de Portugal. Também aqui as abelhas são uma grande ajuda aos agricultores na polinização dos seus sucos. Nos chutes e carvalhais são várias as espécies de cogumelos que a população recolhe, seja para consumo próprio, seja para vender. No que diz respeito ao turismo, várias são as atividades que se podem desenvolver em torno deste recurso. Acreditamos que são estes produtos, com origem nestes ecossistemas, que oferecem muitas oportunidades para o desenvolvimento local. Nós somos uma pequena empresa familiar, atualmente a trabalhar o mel e a castanha longal, uma variedade de castanha nacional. Venham conhecer na nossa terra, visitem! Then perhaps a final video so that we all can take a little bit of air before we move to the last part of uh, uh, this panel forum, uh, this um, policy forum. Gerard? If not, Gerard? Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gerard, for showing these videos. Again, as stated before, we have a collection of these, and we intend certainly, we certainly intend to use these uh, for other purposes uh, as well. So, uh, but we wanted to share this with you and also to provide a short break, if you like, after this uh, quite long uh, panel debate. Now, before we move back and, and, and reconsider or re revisit the manifesto, there is one final new speaker I would like to introduce to you. It is Mr. Shadi Mohana. He is the Director of Rural Development and Natural Resources from the Ministry of Agriculture of Lebanon. He is also the Chair of Silva Mediterranea. Mr. Shadi Mohana, uh, I would like to welcome you and give you, the give you the floor to deliver a presentation on Bridging on Future Initiatives. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, and good afternoon, good evening uh, for all of you. 
it's a real pleasure to see all of you. I see Ignacio here waving, and it's really a pleasure to see a lot of you, even uh, virtually, hoping that we will have the opportunity soon to meet uh, live. So uh, I will try to share my screen. I hope it is it working? It is working, but it's not the presentation mode yet, but it's working. No, it's not the presentation yet? It's yes, but not in presentation mode. It's not full screen. Ah, okay. Yes, that's better. Please. Okay, great. So, uh, Allow me to speak a little bit about uh, the non-wood forest product in the Mediterranean. Some basic statistics uh, that I think most of you know, but uh, I'll try to recall for that. So basically the Mediterranean forests, uh, based on the statistics uh, of 2001, have a value of around 130 euros per hectare. Uh, around 35% of this value is for wood, uh, forest products, 10% for grazing, and only 9% to a non-wood forest product. Unfortunately, this, th these numbers uh, are not uh, well distributed all over the Mediterranean. So if you take, for example, uh, in Europe, uh, those numbers are uh, low. But if you go to the uh, southern part of the Mediterranean or the eastern part of the Mediterranean, where the uh, forests are not really or highly productive in terms of wood, then you will see that the non-wood forest products are, uh, have a much higher value than the one uh, stated uh, here. And another thing is that in developing countries, 80% of the populations, they just in a way or another live or have a good health by using the non-wood forest products. So it has a real socioeconomic importance in uh, developing countries. Uh, also in, uh, in the developed, let's say countries where we have large scale industrial processing, the non-wood forest products are there to provide uh, high uh, value uh, products like we've seen the cork uh, and some other cosmetics uh, like the argan, uh, etc. So we need to keep in mind that the concept of forestry just being for wood and pulp is really limiting to the development of Mediterranean forests. FAO has been doing a lot of work uh, in the countries in order to uh, develop in a way or another the value chains in some non-wood forest product. A lot of work has been done uh, in Algeria, for example, for the cork, uh, some uh, medicinal and aromatic plants. Uh, and there we've seen that the value of the non-wood uh, non forest product was much higher than what we've seen as an average of the, uh, of the Mediterranean. In Mauritania, in Morocco, where we have the argan oil that has started uh, to be a wide industrial product uh, in the cosmetics. In Tunisia, the mastic tree oil and some essential oil from medicinal and aromatic plants is very well developed. In Portugal, we all know, and we've seen it with the panelists that the cork oak is really the, uh, the champion of the non-wood forest product in, uh, in the area. I take the case of my country in Lebanon, we have the Pinus pinea, which is called now the white gold of Lebanon, uh, and the carob, which is used mainly for the carob molasses, which is kind of jam that is uh, highly appreciated in the, in the area. So what is needed to be done? In, uh, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with the Mediterranean forest weeks that uh, happens every two years, and we've been uh, already into six, six editions of the Mediterranean forest week. The last one was in Brumana exactly uh, two years ago. Uh, unfortunately, with the pandemic, we couldn't do uh, a one this year, but we hope that uh, we will be doing it uh, very soon. So in the Agadir, which was, uh, I think, the fifth edition of the uh, Mediterranean Forest Week, there was a co commitment by the countries participating there to rehabilitate around 8 million hectares. 
And among those rehabilitation standards, the non-wood forest products has a major role to play, mainly because they contribute providing sustainable value change and supporting FLR efforts. The country is also committed to increase uh, resilience to help the forest be adapting to climate change in the Mediterranean and also to promote and enhance food security in the Mediterranean drylands. Now we come to the real role of Silva Mediterranea, which is a statutory body of FAO dealing with the forestry uh, issues in the Mediterranean. So, uh, Silva Mediterranea is able to play the role of a platform of exchange of practices in the Mediterranean and support the stakeholders to increase the impact on the ground to achieve the SDGs. SDG 1, uh, 2, against, uh, the one against hunger, SDG 15, a lot of uh, SDGs could be tackled in a way or another by the non-wood forest products development. Also, the group, the Silva Mediterranea, should play a role of facilitator or catalyzer in order to have real viable value chains of the non-wood forest product. Interregional partnerships should be integrated in order to have legal and sustainable value chains. Exchange of data, exchange of knowledge and good practices is essential for a good uh, development of the non-wood forest product. Among other working groups that we have in Silva Mediterranea, we have a working group called the Non-Wood Forest Product Working Group. It used to be the Cork Working Group, but we have upgraded it since 10 years ago, I think, to a more larger scope, which is the Non-Wood Forest Products. Unfortunately, it has been several few, day, few uh, time that this group is a bit... Uh, uh, really on a lethargic, let's say, or in coma. So we commit here to dynamize it with the assistance of the new secretariat of SilvaMed at FAO to really uh, put some energy, revitalize this, uh, this working group. And I invite the countries that are here with us today to uh, really support and take the responsibilities in reviving this working group will also uh, to be considered as a real committed partner to support implementation of recommendations of this workshop and of the white paper. If we wanna look uh, to the future initiatives, well, at the present time, most of the forest management plans do not take the non-wood forest product as an essential. And uh, Mrs. Stefani just mentioned it that in Italy, they are doing this recently, and this is something very good to be taken as uh, an example for the other uh, countries. Uh, so having an inventory of the non-wood forest product is essential in our forest management plans. Branding and labeling is also something very important. When you say uh, the argan, we directly go to uh, Morocco. I spoke about the pinus pinea, the pine nuts of, uh, of Lebanon. You can have some uh, geographic uh, standards also to have in these kind of, of products. The creation of consortium, we spoke about the exchange of successful case studies, ex exchange of experience, which is essential for uh, the development, the fast development of non-wood forest product. They are essential in a lot of, country, uh, lot of countries, as I said before. The private initiative is essential and we need to provide the small producers. We've seen just a video now about the chestnut producers and the honey producers. These kind of uh, initiatives are essential to be uh, subsidized uh, in a way or another, assisted through grants or credits or micro credits. Otherwise, it is difficult for these kind of initiatives to uh, really reach the high standard that is needed. Marketing strategies and training are essential. You know, we all try to, we thrive to get organic agricultural products, organic tomato, organic fruits, organic. We can easily sell our non-wood forest product as organic product. They are naturally organic. 
we don't use pesticides, we don't use fertilizers to produce mushrooms or truffles or pine nuts or uh, other products. So this is something that should be really taken into, uh, into consideration, this organic label of those uh, products. And uh, if we want to, let's say, uh, develop more, we need to facilitate the exchange between the countries of the Mediterranean. So reducing some administrative and regulative barriers is very essential to, uh, to this process. Promoting the citizens' engagement. You know, uh, Mrs. Polyakova mentioned that in Ukraine, this, these products are free to be collected. It is also in many other countries. So we need to legalize in a way or another and promote the citizens that these products need to be collected in a sustainable way. They need to remain available for the next generations. Uh, new market opportunities should be created. You know, we mentioned that uh, Europe is a big consumer of non-wood forest product without being a big producer because the, for the European forests are mainly dedicated for uh, pulp and, and wood, which is the opposite of what we've seen in the uh, eastern part and the southern part of the Mediterranean. So these exchanges can be very good for the developing countries where they would be able to uh, export some of their products. And we should not forget that, uh, as I said it before, these, uh, if we put some investment in the non-wood forest product, it would be essential to help reaching the SDGs, multiple uh, SDGs, one, two, uh, eight, if I recall well, and of course the SDG uh, 15. And uh, now I'm reaching the end of this presentation. I would like to highlight uh, the present, the what we're going to we'll be talking about the manifesto, which is really our. Uh, it should be kind of master plan uh, for us in order to move forward in the development of the non-wood uh, forest product. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, listening, for inviting me to really give the, uh, the, uh, some ideas about what Silva Mediterranea can do and uh, in the non-wood forest products. Uh, I hope I did not go beyond my seven minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Mohana, for uh, offering us yet another perspective from a key stakeholder as well pointing towards this working group, connecting also many of your comments to statements uh, that have been made throughout this uh, policy forum. Normally, especially looking at the time, I don't think we can take questions, but if it is Inacio raising his hand, I think it is fair to say that he has a special sure. position in this uh, forum. So please, Inacio. No, just to say thank you, Shadi. Thank you very much for this overview and for, for, for throwing also your own priorities and your own views on, on this. There's one aspect that you mentioned at the end that I want to, to ask you to, if you could develop a bit. You mentioned about, uh, about exchange, knowledge exchange, about better integration in the Mediterranean region. Our white paper is focusing a lot to Europe, but we're conscious that Europe is also important as, in, and as a key partner for many, for many countries in the Silva Mediterranean, in Eastern and Southern Mediterranean. So in this call for action, how can how can Europe better develop this Euro Mediterranean region, and what could Europe do best to improve this integration that you were mentioning across the across the basin? Thank you. A short response, please. Yeah, 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 I'll be very very brief. You know, I think we can work on two uh, levels. The first is exchange of knowledge. You know, between Europe and the developed people that have, and we have started having some expertise in that. For example, we, uh, some of our uh, colleagues in Lebanon and other countries, they went to Spain and they learned the grafting of Pinus Pinea, which was something that existing, and it helped a lot now developing this, uh, this product. Also, we should know uh, and try to limit the barriers, as I said, of exchange, because uh, the Europe European standards are sometimes uh, too much difficult for the other countries in order to be able to export those. So I think a common understanding of uh, what is needed could help a lot in uh, getting a, a compromise between the countries. Okay, excellent. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at the time and I think we really need to proceed now with what is going to be the final part of this uh, policy forum. So I turn to Sven Walter. At the beginning of this policy forum, 
you have introduced this document, the manifesto. We have invited all attendees to take a closer look at the document, state perhaps some opinions, make some suggestions, etc. We have restated our question to continue to bring in these uh, suggestions uh, throughout the policy forum. But now I'm looking at you. Can you can you tell us what is the type of suggestions that have come in and what does it mean for the manifesto? Do we need to write a completely new manifesto or tell us? Thank you very much, Stephen. And I don't think that we need a new master plan or a new manifesto of Alguero to get the name right this time. But really, thank you very much for all the inputs we got. We got many. And we also try to respond to the different colleagues who submitted their proposals. And so let me just share with you also my screen and give you a little and a quick update. I hope you can see the manifesto, Stephen. Yes, it's so, excellent. Please. Excellent. So let me first say again that when it comes to the scope that we were aiming at a manifesto which targets Europe, but in a global perspective meaning we heard very much from you know, Europe being also a main importer of Lombard Forest products. We just heard from, from Chadi on the relevance and the linkages to the Silver Mediterranean and of course to other regions. And by the way, that is of course for us of being an FAO, very important that we see this in the global context. And that's what we would like to also summarize in the manifesto. I then added, or we added, actually, some of the comments we received, and I left it here by purpose in track changes, so that the colleagues and participants can see what has been done and what has been introduced. Again, we tried to keep the document concise. We do not want to duplicate, obviously, the white paper, but we took note that some more products must be and should be added, and there were some concrete proposals. We also added a reference to the Mediterranean region. Also, it is, of course, a European scope, which we are having, but we know that through the incredible, we have a strong reference to the Mediterranean there. And also, as I mentioned yesterday, while talking about the importance of forests as a source of non-wood forest products, we highlighted also the link to the agricultural lands which again is uh, very important in particular for the Mediterranean region. We got a confirmation on the SDGs and on the scope with regard to the policies. And I think the panel discussion was very clear about the potential of mainstreaming non wood forest products in these policies. We highlighted again, in addition to healthy food, also it should also be healthy food, the high quality gastronomy, which you know, is an interesting market. And I think also today, there were many references to what Davide called the associated regulatory and cultural services. And so we wanted to highlight the tourism, which came through um, at different types. And again, not that we wanted to highlight it, but it came from you, from the participants who actually requested to make these references in. Also here to highlight the viability of solutions, meaning also thinking about the socio and economic sustainability to strike for was highlighted. We then have a section talking about weaknesses and threats. And while we acknowledge the importance of the informal sector, a proposal has been made to focus in particular on the illegal side of trade and to address it. When we're talking about Europe as a leading importer, we are highlighting here the risk, but obviously we know that we can also highlight the opportunities as that Europe comes and plays in this regard. And we will come back to this at the latter part and the next page of the manifesto. In addition, there was a strong, and even today in the panel, we had this distinction between private and state-owned forests and that it has an impact on the governing system with regard to non wood forest products. And we got a proposal to highlight the monitoring systems, both when it comes to biophysical and to socioeconomic data that we have better data available. I think it started from the first session, highlighting the outreach activities and education. 
And also today we talked about standard setting being, you know, very important to highlight the standards and of course talking about investments and getting increased sustainable finance and investments uh, in order to develop the different sectors. Europe plays again an important role with regard to trade so that we highlight that both consumption and production should be sustainable, but also the trade aspects. And that in order to do so, we definitely need a strong linkage of and with the private sector in order to promote collaborative uh, collaboration and partnership and have the right tools available, including fiscal and labor regimes, but also again, certification and traceability. And in order to do so, we need to have a stronger and a strong collaboration of all organizations involved with the aim to share information on non-good service products. And in order to, uh, as a main outcome of this, that we need, of course, to join forces and to not only look at green growth and the eco-sociological progresses, but also to, uh, to contribute to cultural resilience. So these were, in a nutshell, Stephen, the comments we got and which we integrated. We managed to keep it at four pages and we hope that this will be a tool which will help us in our communication and which also showcases the commitment which we have as participants to further promote the contribution of non voice products to the socioeconomic development. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sven, for, for basically guiding us through this document. I, I think I need to congratulate you on I me mean, to process all this information of incoming suggestions, etc., in a very short amount of time, and then still produce this document, which I think we can all see has become a more refined document in the sense that it contains, on the one hand, a little bit more detail uh, here and there, and at the same time, uh, provide a little bit more balances, uh, probably. And so I think the overall result is certainly a more uh, refined document. So thank you so much for the efforts. Now, the next step that we were to do, obviously, is, well, we have taken into account the suggestions that we have received. And before we could use this document, obviously we need to know from the attendees the following thing, or basically we need to know your answers to the following question. We are not at all asking any formal position from your organization, right? We can't do that at this stage. We understand that you are here probably not, uh, not to say representing your organization in any formal capacity, but we would need to know your personal position on this. Are you willing to endorse this manifesto of Alguero with the changes presented by uh, Sven Walter? And do you think it is a good document? Yes or no? And the answers could be, for all of you, you could say, yes, I think it's a good document. I endorse it. Yeah? Or it could be that you say, Yes, I like it, but I still had a comment to be made and I didn't manage to send it in time. So if you would be willing to consider my suggestion, I will be able to, uh, or I will endorse it. And so that might be another option. Or it is still possible that you say, no, I don't like this document. It's a very bad document. There is no use for it. Okay. So what we would like to do is a very short polling. And if the technology doesn't fail, we should be able to even do it within Zoom. If it doesn't work, then we just switch to the book lab that you already have uh, used in the previous sessions. But let's give it a try if we can manage this within Zoom. It's ready uh, to go, Stephen, launching now. Excellent. Okay, so you see the question. It's your personal position that we are uh, interested in. I think uh, it's open now, right? It's coming in. It works. We have. It's only the attendees. Thirty-five votes. Yes. Panelists can also vote. Oh. Maybe as host, you can't vote, Stephen. Okay. <laughs> Your co-host. <laughs> I think you can guess what would have been my vote, but it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> We've got forty-five votes. Oh, we have more than 50 votes now, yes. They are coming in, that's good. That's very good. So we have 82 participants. So let's let's try to reach 
to go beyond 60 responses. We're closing in to 60. Let's continue to, to vote, please. We haven't received any recently, so shall I draw it to an end? I think it's good, yes. So what we have is we have we have more than 50 participants, so all, let's say roughly 60 participants that have voted. We have 91% who said yes, the way it is, and 9%, so five people say, yes, I will endorse this document, but I still have a suggestion I would like you to consider. So these two together says that basically we have 100% of all the persons that have voted basically say yes to this document. I think this is just a tremendous success. What do you think, Sven? What is your reaction to this? This is uh, impressive and great. I was very, yeah, not nervous, but very curious how this will work, in particular in Zoom, where unfortunately we don't have this direct engagement, you know, with the participants. I mean, most we know each other, but um, that would have been, of course, you know, even much more effective. So I think it is great. It's a pleasure and it was also great actually to get your input, which I mean, together with Sarah, we reviewed them and they were really excellent. And so I think I can just invite the colleagues in particular, the ones who indicated it just now to send us please any other input if possible by end of the week. So with that we can basically based on the discussion we had try to continue fine tuning it. And then I would understand that this is basically, you know, endorsed and will help us, I think, from FAO side, but also EFI and hopefully all you and participants in your communication and outreach, because as Shadi mentioned it as a master plan, to see these are the priority areas we see as important to engage. And obviously, as for speaking now for FAO as a co-host, you have, you know, our full engagement to continue doing it together with the colleagues which we have here, um, like, uh, for example, Chadi for Silver Mediterranean, or also Ms. Polikova, uh, who is the acting chair of the European Forestry Commission, but obviously also the other region. So it's a great uh, result, and thanks a lot to all participants who have contributed to it. Thanks to you, Stephen. I, th I think in 10 years' time, in 10 years' time, we might look back at this document that will have been circulating, uh, probably even at the global scale, Everybody will refer to this Manifesto of Alguero, and you, participants of this event, you will know two things. First, you were there, you were at the basis of this document, and second, you will probably be the only ones to know that, yes, it is called Manifesto of Alguero, but basically it's a virtual Alguero, right? So, and that is something only the participants, the attendees to this uh, um, uh, forum will know. So thank you so much. This is, uh, I think, very good news we have here. So let's now proceed, perhaps by handing the word to Inazio. Inazio, we know what to do now with this uh, manifesto, which is great, but could you perhaps explain just uh, the next steps on the white paper, the incredible project, etc.? Okay, thank you. I will try to be very brief because I'm worried with the time and yes. all participants will have other things to do. So, yeah, Incredible Project is, is finishing end of April. We still have some work, so we invite you to join us for the next activities that are still happening. Because of the COVID situation, one of our inter-regional workshops on resin and also other green chemicals, style oils, will, will be happening in April. I think we, we can post the link to the to the event. We will, we will discussing issues specifically related to, to, to resins and, and other uh, pine chemicals, uh, looking at innovation, science, and looking also at this market side, uh, which is so important, this marketing side. And then, and then uh, also in April, we'll be having the, the final conference. So if you want to meet the incredible community and continue understanding better what we have done, the key achievements, the repository, the open innovation challenges, and this white paper will be presented there. So we invite you all. We can also post uh, the link into the web. Of course, we will feed the, all this all this knowledge into our new 
Mediterranean research agenda we're developing, highlighting the key knowledge gaps in this, in respect to non-wood forest projects. Also, so for us, it's, it's a living, it's a living document, living material, and, and we're, we're very happy with all the inputs received. Now we will finalize the white book, also the white paper. For, we'll be presented the final version in this uh, incredible general assembly. So we'll try to collect all your inputs and feedbacks. We got quite many quite many elements to, to better tackle. It was environmental education that maybe we need to put it stronger. It was ecosystem restoration and the role of non for exposure there that could be better reflected. Extension of practices with cases, some access to find. There are many elements that we will capture and, and we will introduce there to, to make sure that we have uh, gathered the feeling. In general terms, we are very happy uh, that I think we, we are all in uh, uh, converging in a common vision on, on what is the way ahead. So stay tuned to our channels and, and you are always welcome to all. To more incredible events. Excellent. Well, this brings us, I would say, to the end of this uh, policy forum. I think we had uh, two day very intensive uh, <laughs> sessions, I would say. Um, we are very pleased to see that even though, and we realize that we're running behind scheme now for uh, 15 minutes, so I'm going to keep it very short, but we still have 80 participants to this policy forum. I hope I can interpret this as a signal, as an indication that it matters to you and that we have uh, created, I hope, an event that you found uh, valuable. I would like to thank all speakers for today's session, for today's sessions in plural, also for the sessions of yesterday. I would like to thank all attendees for being here, for spending your time on this. There are always so many other things that you could have been doing. We're well aware of this. So the fact that you decided, it's your decision to have been part of this, um, is something that we can only appreciate and we really value this and we're grateful for that. Then obviously there is the entire team of organizers. I'm not going to, to mention all the names, etc. But I think uh, we all realize that without decent support, even behind the scheme, uh, the, the screens, uh, there is, uh, it, it would not be uh, the same uh, experience that we could offer. I would like to wish you all the best before you're sending off, before sending you off, uh, I think Sarah would like to um, set up a, a kind of a group picture for all panelists. Is that possible? How do we do that, Sarah? Absolutely, um, Stephen, thank you. I would like to invite now all of the panelists, please turn on your videos so that we can do a group photo. Unfortunately, we can't do it with all attendees, as you know, the limitations um, on video that we have in this particular format. But, but if all the these... panelists would now um, turn on your videos so that we can see you all and then I'm going to tell you when would be a good time um, for you to smile <laughs> and I'll be able to take the photograph. Just a minute, I'm just going to make one modification. Um, just a second. Okay, I can't get rid of any, hold on. Brilliant. Okay, we have the modification that I needed. Um, I hope you will see all of the smiling panelists now, and I will let you know when I am ready to take the photo. So just let's do a three, two, one. I think that works. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. And all the best to all of the participants, to all of you. I think we had a great event. Thank you so much. Good luck. Success to all of you. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye-bye.